Welcome everybody to our uh, January 18th work session. Appreciate seeing you all here. Um, we'll call the meeting to order. And um, Nikki, if you'll lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, we're going to head into one of our favorite things every year. Um, sorry, my glasses are fogging up because of my mask. Um, we have our Firefighter of the Year presentation. So I am going to turn that over to Chief Parks. Come on down. I don't have to talk through there. Morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Morning. Commissioners, Jeff Parks, who's the Fire Chief. And I'd like to uh, present Justin Robinson, our Firefighter of the Year, and if we can tell you a little bit about why he was selected. So it was recently brought to the attention of the Dunedin Fire Rescue Administration that an act of heroism by one of our department's members occurred while the individual was off duty. On July 25th, 2021, Firefighter Paramedic Justin Robinson and his friend Joe went surfing on Florida's East Coast. During their trip, Justin's friend slammed headfirst into the shallows of the beach with significant force. When Joe finally resurfaced from beneath the crashing waves, his head was barely above water. With waves continuing to break over Joe's head, he was able to yell for help. Justin, hearing his friend, quickly swam to, assist, swam to him to assist, unaware of the seriousness of the situation. When Justin reached Joe, it was clear that he was having difficulty staying above water. While Justin began to assist his friend, Joe explained to Justin that he thinks he broke his neck and could not move or feel anything from the neck down. Concerned for his friend, Justin positioned the much larger Joe into a rescue position and carefully swam them both to the safety of shore. Once on shore, Justin further assessed him, maintaining strict spinal precautions not to exacerbate any injuries. Unfortunately, all the signs and symptoms pointed to a significant spinal injury. While continuing to protect him from further injury, Justin called 911. When fire rescue arrived, Justin reiterated the seriousness of his friend's injuries and directed the crew to, retrieve, to retrieve the backboard. Justin, being a, a great patient advocate, as he is on every call, insisted the fire crew use the correct method and equipment to minimize further injury. The crew complied and the crew safely moved Joe to waiting ambulance where Justin again explained the seriousness of Joe's injuries and suggested the crew, ambulance crew transport Joe to the nearest trauma center. Shortly after Joe arrived at the ER, doctors confirmed that he had a C6 fracture and was airlifted to Shands for further treatment. While Joe's prognosis is uncertain, he's shown significant signs of improvement since arriving at Shands. Joe has regained some use of upper extremities and some feeling in his foot. Joe's outcome might have been quite different if it were not for Justin's quick thinking and paramedic expertise. With that, it was determined that Justin, Firefighter Paramedic Justin Robinson's actions are worthy of Dunedin's Firefighter of the Year Award for 2021-2022. And if I can also add, we've also nominated him as the Florida State Elks Association First Responder of the Year and the Florida State Firefighters Association Career Firefighter of the Year. So we'll hopefully hear from one of those soon. If I can uh, present a plaque to Justin, the Firefighter of the Year Award, presented to Firefighter Justin Robinson, recognition of outstanding achievement and dedication to duty, Dunedin Fire Rescue 2021-2022. Uh, <laughs> have a uh, pin that he can wear on his uniform to signify Firefighter of the Year. So. Justin, do you have family here? Uh, they're not here this morning. Gotcha. Thanks. Well, if they're watching, we want to tell you just how proud we are of you. Um, and for those watching on the TV, you can't see all the firefighters that are in, either in the room or out in the uh, lobby that are here to support you, which is always very heartwarming to see. And with COVID protocols, we're all just trying to be careful. Otherwise, we'd all be down to take a picture with you, but we're just trying to stay away from each other. Um, but thank you so much. And, you know, what you've what you did for your friend, you would have done anyway, 
but the skill set that you have and that you show for all of our Dunedin residents um, was reflected in your action, and you are certainly deserving of our Firefighter of the Year. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. You want to say something? Just thank you very much. <laughs> Great job. Come on, guys. Great job. Thank <laughs> you. Well, and hopefully, don't forget, you will automatically be invited to the John Maroney um, uh, dinner uh, at some point with all of us. They did cancel it because of COVID, but they'll redo it. And when they do, even if it's next year, you will be coming with us, you and your significant other. Thank you. Congratulations. Great job. Oh, okay, so uh, now we'll turn to um, citizen input. Anybody wishing to speak to any item that's not already on the agenda? Sir, come on down. Give us your name and address for the record and you'll get three minutes. Good morning, my name is Tony Suarez and I live 470 Glen Cairn Circle here in Dunedin. Rebecca. And it's just had a couple of thoughts on the uh, dangerous intersection uh, at uh, Skinner and the, and the Pinellas Trail. Um, I travel the trail just about every day on my bike or walk or whatever. And just recently I've been noticing even driving by in my car, um, especially heading west, the two oak trees on either side of the trail on the near Eli's and the Scone Age cast a very big shadow and it's almost like camouflage for the bike riders coming through or, and for the um, people in the cars to see them. And there's only about 40 feet from those uh, safety barricades until you get to the, to the street um, and when they come out into the daylight. And I, you know, as I say, I travel the uh, trail a lot and I, and I know what to look for. And even the other day, I was looking for bicyclists coming to, and I didn't even see one to the last second and they weren't gonna stop. Anyway, um, so I'm suggesting that possibly um, the road crew go out there and just take a look at it and see the possibility of trimming back the trees just a little bit. Because as I say, the shadow line is right there on those safety posts. Um, and that would give a few extra seconds for people. And then uh, on the other side of the coin, um, the owners should also be put on the bicyclists, obviously, to stop. And um, seeing that the, uh, the blinking lights uh, for the cars seem to be you know, fairly effective, it might also help to put um, continuous little blinking lights around the stop signs on either side of Skinner for the bicyclists. There's a little white sign below those stop signs saying cross traffic, you know, does not stop or something to that effect. And nobody pays attention to that. Um, they can maybe put a little sign saying dangerous intersection and then have the continuous flashing lights there and it might get more people's attention. I heard there was another accident last night. Um, so anyway, yeah, that shade definitely is, is a factor, and especially in the late afternoon, too, when people had the drivers have the sun in their eyes heading west. Anyway, that's uh, you know, something, I know you have got multi-million dollar projects in the offing, but in the meantime, that might be something that may help. Thank you so much, we okay. appreciate it. And just so you know, we are working on the tree trimming. Oh. Um, we're working on a, a, some additional signage. Everything you've just said, we're working on. Oh, I didn't realize They're that. all in the pipeline. Somehow I missed that. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> we appreciate it. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Sir, come on down. <clears throat> Give us your name and address for the record and you'll have three minutes, clock's above my head. Mm. Uh, Ronald Ogden, 1757 <clears throat> Hampton Lane, Dunedin. Uh, commissioners, uh, a few weeks ago, I spoke with Commissioner Torga uh, to complain about the rest of you. And in our discussion, he decided and I decided that it probably would be a good thing if I came in and talked to you directly. So here I am. And this has to do with a news article that appeared 
Well, it's probably been at least a month, more than that, maybe six weeks ago, in which four commissioners endorsed a Democratic candidate for the Congressional District CD13, Mr. Diamond. And, um, of course, it is entirely your right to endorse whom you wish, and I would stand up for your First Amendment rights to make such endorsements. But, commissioners, what bothers me about this is that you were able to exercise a right to endorse that frankly is not allowed to citizens of Dunedin in, quote, nonpartisan municipal elections. And while you could say that by endorsing Mr. Diamond in a race in the south part of the county, you may not have been violating the letter of the nonpartisan municipal regulations or ordinances that I'm discussing, clearly, ladies, sir, you violated the spirit of it. If you're going to be advocates for nonpartisanship in your community, then be nonpartisan and don't make partisan endorsements. On the other hand, if you would like every American citizen's right to make partisan endorsements, then grant it to everybody else in your city. I'd like specifically to ask you to undertake a thorough and urgent review of those ordinances, I believe it's 212 or something like that, if I remember right off the top of my head, that deal with the restrictions against partisan activity in municipal elections. These are violations of the very First Amendment rights that you, ladies and sir, were free to utilize, as is your American right to utilize them. All I'm saying is, if you believe in First Amendment rights, if you believe in the political process, please take steps to grant it to everybody in your city. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Nikki, can you please advise if we've violated our charter? I'll review the facts that have been alleged and I'll let you all know if I sure. have any concerns, but I'm not aware of what article he's talking about. And it's I'll the Charter it. of Nonpartisan, and it's about... Well, I heard also allegations about involvement in local elections, or which is which is another thing about the um, elections code, so I'm happy to, to review it, but I haven't before coming here this morning. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for anybody's... Because uh, I don't believe we've violated anything, but uh, just... For anybody's knowledge, um, I've also endorsed a Republican candidate, uh, Dave Eggers, for Pinellas County Commission. So, um, and that doesn't stop anyone in this room or anyone listening from doing the same. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Citizen input. Okay, we'll come back to the commission. Um, our consent agenda, which is the approval of the minutes of December 14th and January 6th, Board and Committee appointments to the Committee on Aging, um, a locally funded agreement um, with Forward Pinellas and um, FDOT on the Complete Streets uh, Improvement Program for Skinner Boulevard. Are there any items to be uh, pulled? Um, I just have one correction to the minutes. Okay. Uh, well, hang on for that one. Well, okay. Which one is it? Which? It is the work session on Brick Streets, and Ray Bouchard is B. It's twenty one twenty one. Bouchard is B O U C H A R D. Public input. Anybody else? Okay. With that correction, can I have a motion to approve? Okay, Vice Mayor and Commissioner Franey. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. I just want to point out, I didn't want to pull it, but I did want to point out that uh, if you didn't notice, um, the Skinner Boulevard issue, obviously, we're, we're um, approving the agreement um, for the funding of the design work for Skinner that we just, that's what we just approved. Um, so it is getting started earlier than we had hoped and FDOT is putting significantly more money into it than they originally planned. So that's, that's awesome. Can I just, uh, so it's going to, you're gonna start with design, survey and design mm -hmm. as soon as this is, uh, 
all executed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Good thing. Okay, and then we'll go on to action items. We have resolution 22-05, amending resolution 92-4, which establishes the Committee on Environmental Quality. Nikki, resolution 2205, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Dunedin, Florida, amending resolution 924, which established the Committee on Environmental Quality to change the name of the committee to Committee on Environmental Quality and Sustainability to adjust membership and other requirements of the committee and providing for an effective date. And this has been reading of resolution 2205 by title only. Thank you. Can I have a motion to approve? Um, so Someone second. second. Okay. <laughs> Is everybody pro? Vice Mayor Kynes and Commissioner Gal. Thank you. Nikki? Or Rebecca? I'm not sure who will be taking this one. These are the um, changes that the commission directed um, with regard to the report received from the Committee on Environmental Quality um, during its three-year annual review. And this reflects all the changes directed hey, by the Natalie. commission. There she is. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Uh, this came before you and we discussed some of the changes for the resolution, the name change, um, adding to the, the duties of the committee as well as those gender neutral terms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions? No, um, my motion did include that. You added sustainability and you changed it from chairperson and vice chairperson, correct? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, any feedback from the public? Seeing or hearing none, I'll come back to the commission. Um, we have a motion and a second. Any final comments? Nope. All right, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Freeney? Aye. Commissioner Tonga? Aye. Commissioner Gow? Aye. Vice Mayor Kynes? Aye. Mayor Aye, and that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Natalie. All right, now we have the Equipment Master Leasing Services for Solid Waste uh, Vehicles, which is a resolution 2204. Nikki, would you please read that by title only? Yes, this one's a little longer, so bear with me. Yeah. Resolution 2204, a resolution of the City Commission of the City of Dunedin, Florida, authorizing the lease purchase financing of the acquisition of a new Way 31 YD ASL Sidewinder Auto Car ACX Chassis Refuge Truck, approving, <laughs> Sorry. approving the form of and authorizing the execution and delivery of a master equipment lease purchase agreement, including any schedules attached thereto, with Bank of America National Association, approving the form of and authorizing the execution and delivery of an, ex, of an escrow agreement in connection therewith, with Bank of America National Association, authorizing the execution and delivery of other documents required in connection therewith, making certain covenants and agreements in connection therewith, and providing an effective date. And this has been reading of resolution 2204. I'm sure staff will make its presentation, but I also wanted the commission to know that your bond counsel, Dwayne Draper, is here um, as well today, in case you have any um, questions with regard to the financing. Okay, uh, can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. All right, Commissioner Franey and Commissioner Gao, thank you. I don't know who's making the presentation, but shoot. Uh, that'll be me and the first one. Uh, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, Les Tyre, the Finance Director. This item is Resolution 21, 2204, Equipment Master Lease Services with Bank of America. Uh, this is for a solid waste vehicle uh, lease agreement. The key members of our finance team are here with us today. We have uh, Dwayne Draper with uh, Bryant Miller Olive with us today. And we also have uh, our city attorney, Nikki Day. I'd like to go over some brief background for this item. Uh, the purpose of this project was to identify a financial institution that the city could contract with to finance the purchase of a solid waste vehicle, uh, the purchase of the vehicle was approved by the City Commission on February 16, 2021. The City Commission was informed that the City staff would finance the purchase of this vehicle for 2021. Uh, RFP 22-1195 for Equipment Master Lease Services was advertised on October 8, 2021, requesting financing rates for a lease purchase of the vehicle. The rate quoted was based on a formula and published index rate the suggested rate is, a, is an interest rate swap rate for three-year rate. The swap rate is a benchmark used uh, to set the borrowing cost for future leases. The term of the agreement, uh, the lease agreement is a five-year agreement with B of A. This will allow the city to use this agreement for the purchases of vehicles over the next four-year time period as needed. 
Uh, two proposals were submitted in response to the RFP uh, by November 9th, 2021 submittal deadline. Uh, an evaluation committee was develop, uh, developed to review the and to score the proposals. Uh, Bank of America Public Capital Corp uh, submitted the proposal that ranked the highest by the committee. B of A's proposal is interest rate of 1.65% over a five-year period. The borrowed amount is $333,808, and the annual payments are $70,184. Uh, the city is, re is required to enter into a master lease agreement with B of A as part of this process. Nikki Day, city attorney, and Dwayne Draper, BMO Bond Council, have reviewed the terms of the lease agreement and the conditions of the, of the documents and find them to be acceptable. And staff is requesting the city commission approve resolution 22-04 and authorize staff to enter into a master lease agreement with Bank of America to borrow $333,808 to finance the purchase of one solid waste vehicle. That concludes my general comments. Just want to mention again that we do have Dwayne Draper with BMO to answer any uh, technical or legal type questions you may have. Thank you. Any questions for, um, and this is just the lease agreement. This is not the actual, we're not talking about the vehicles. If you want to talk about the vehicles, that's in the next piece of this, right? That's correct. Yeah, this just is just the lease agreement. Right. So any questions on the lease agreement? Mayor, may I? Sure. Uh, Les, within the, the scoring system, mm -hmm. I believe we have something within our, our process is one of those categories is determining whether or not uh, those institutions have any current fines or, or anything against the city. Is that still part of the process and did you find any fines at all with Bank of America? And if so, what were they? Yes, uh, th yes, that is part of our process. We, we sc the score are, is 100 points possible and we, and we uh, identify up, up to five points uh, with that, it's called a bank penalty form is what we call it. And so it's basically 5% of the scoring. But yeah, uh, in this case, uh, B of A has fines. They, they have violations. Uh, the, uh, both, both firms did not fill out the paperwork correctly. Uh, we, we asked for certain information. Uh, we asked for their, their asset values, and we asked for, d d have you had fines uh, in the past, things like that. So B of A, uh, you know, partially fill theirs out, and so do the other firm that submitted. So neither one got five points, I would say, you know, so they both got, you know, depending on the reviewer, anywhere from uh, zero to four points, I, I, would, I would estimate, as, as far as their points. But, uh, but yeah, we, we are using it in the process, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, for the, in, in this particular scoring, we had three reviewers, all three reviewers chose B of A uh, as the highest ranking. Uh, we were unanimous on that, and the other firm was number two. Uh, does that answer your question? Or? Uh, it, it, it does, and it sounds like they did have some fines, and it's only 5%, uh, but they also didn't fill out the paperwork correctly, and I know we're trying to balance the best partner, but also within some sort of time frame. We can't keep going out to bid waiting for that perfect partner. Uh, but do we have... Do we have any leverage? What, what's to encourage these, these institutions uh, to get them to fill out a complete package, a complete, you know, who, uh, you know, I guess what leverage do we have, if any? That's a good question. Uh, I'm, gonna have, I'm gonna ask Chuck to add to this. I'm gonna uh, try to cover it quickly, but first, uh, a lot of them don't fill it out. Some, uh, you know, in this proposal, we had two that responded. Uh, we had, uh, in our last proposal, we did, a, uh, we did a bank loan for the property purchase. In that situation, we had about half, half filled it out properly, half did not. You know? And it's varying degrees. Some people, some of the firms don't address it at all, and, uh, and, uh, and others, others uh, you know, do partially fill it out. So as far as leverage, I mean, we, we can't make them fill it out. You know, we, we, uh, we address, we, we definitely address how they, how they completed in the scoring in, in that, with that five-point section for penalty form. Chuck, you want to add to that at all? Or? Um, I would only add that uh, um, our leverage is that we have points and they, a percentage of their overall evaluation is based on their completing that form. And if they don't complete the form, they get zero points for that category. Um, as Les said, our, our average is probably 50% of uh, firms that submit uh, complete that correctly. Um, 
so the, the idea of the 5%, you know, we had a long discussion about how do we balance the desire to get somebody who's had minimal or no fines with the, the counter um, rate indicator. You know, you don't want to pay $100,000 more in interest to get somebody who's had slightly fewer fines than somebody else. So that was how we, you know, we looked for that balance, and that's how we came up with the five points. Um, so that's really our only leverage is if we were to increase the, the weight of that category in the overall scheme of things, it might make it uh, more important for them. You know, they might take it more seriously. Um, so that's really our leverage to answer your question. Okay. And so is there, okay, and I understand there can be little to no discussion with them during the bidding process um, without the concern that now you're tampering with the process itself. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact that we uh, there's a choice up for a, a vote here, once we make that vote, is that now an opportunity to now, as a partner with the city, can we clear up those fines? Is this an opportunity to re-engage and, hey, let's, you know, clear up whatever the past issue was? I'm not sure I understand your question. If you're saying, can we go back to them now and ask them what the fines are? Is that well, it, well, this is, they have an infraction with the city from my understanding, right? Isn't that what the, no. what, what, what are the fines then? Let's back up. Oh, okay. okay. Go ahead. No, they, they have. Not uh, specifically, but is the fine, do they owe us or do we owe them? No, actually the fines, uh, uh, the, the, the issue is not that they owe the city anything at all. That, that, that's not the issue. The, the form is designed to, there's a question of whether or not they owe the city, but the, but the bigger question that we're looking at with this form is what violations have they had with, uh, in their, uh, such as uh, malpractice and, and, and things like that, such as B of A has lots of violations for uh, what happened in the, uh, in the Great Depression with, with the mortgage industry going upside down, you know, and so does Wells Fargo and so does a lot of other banks. Those are the type of violations that, that we're, Okay. that we're really focusing on. But, but we asked both questions, but, but the violations that uh, they have are related to those type and, and not, not with our city. Okay, all right, all right. Well, then I, I feel much better then. Um, but it's still important that... Good question. That, 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 I misunderstood that, that it does question. play a role. So I'm, I'm, uh, I support the question in the process. All right, thank you, sir, very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Can I ask a question on what you were just asking? Sure. Is there... Is there um, is there any benefit you just indicated, Chuck, that, you know, the possibility is you just, you raise the weight. W what if you raise those points? Well, that, that would change that equation of the balance between the rate that you're, you know, the extra interest potentially you're willing to pay, um, to get somebody who's had fewer fines. So, you know, that's our discussion. If you don't think five points is enough, then we can certainly, uh, review that. Well, I, I don't want to make that determination. Yeah. That's not, that's, I don't think that's for us. I, I, I'm just calling it out for you all to have a discussion about it. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there's both sides of the coin, you know. Does it deter um, or does it help us? And that's the balance and you all have the expertise there. But I would also say, if it's not filled out completely, why wouldn't you just kick it back? Maybe you don't change the points, you just kick it back. You know, because, I mean, if we go for a grant with the government and it's not filled out appropriately, they don't accept it. So I, I'm just saying, it's just a, so you all determine that. That's an administrative policy that I don't want to get myself into. But, you know, we started doing this because it was called out that a certain bank had various fines. And, and as you said, during the recession, every bank had fines. No bank went unscathed. You know, it's just a matter of how, uh, how much. And, of course, it's also about the size of the bank. If you're going to have more fines if you're a bigger organization. Mm -hmm. Right. And, again, that's not for us to determine. You all know that, and you all know how to compare it. But So maybe at some point in the future you all sit down and talk about it and, and now that you've had a chance to see how it's working, mm -hmm. you know, and see if it's doing what it's supposed to do. Thank you. Any other questions for our staff on the lease? Um, I did have a question, uh -huh. and I asked Jennifer, and, you know, I think maybe you want to talk to this history. Chuck, you may know it better, but, you know, at one point, we were doing all the, le the lease purchase, and 
Then we got to a point, and I remember this a few years ago, we said, no, we shouldn't really be doing lease purchase. We want to be able to uh, pay for them, pay as you go, almost. So what has led us back here to the, to the lease purchases? Just we, uh, we did our five-year rate study, and Bill can add to this, but we, we did, uh, Solid Waste did the five-year rate study that was done about a year ago, and in that analysis, our, the consultants working with us determined that within, within, within the proposed rate structure, it was not, uh, our rates would have had to have gone up dramatically more to be able to convert from financing to paying cash up front. So, so the decision was in that five-year plan that we would continue to lease vehicles the next you know, five-year period, maybe look at it again next time. But, but that's, that's kind of, the, when I first got here, there, uh, you know, in talking to staff, the plan was to move to starting to purchase them with cash. But, what, but once we did the five-year study and looked at the numbers, uh, it, that, that didn't make sense, you know, uh, uh, at least the next five-year time frame. Okay. Bill, you want to add to that? Or? Uh, no, you, you, well, a couple of things to give a little bit more color to that picture, but less is right, is when we did our rate study, really the, the, the results of it is how much stress do we put on our rates with other mechanisms at play. One of them is the fund itself, uh, how much in reserves are we able to have built up when a truck is needed to be replaced with an expected life cycle of five to eight years. A garbage trucks you'll see in the next agenda item is $300,000, if you will. So it's really is that how much stress can we put on the rate, also have a balance of our reserves, and going out and having this, this as our mechanism for funding source for these new truck purchases is giving us more pay-as-you-go way where we don't pay on this debt until the truck is delivered. 2024. You got it. And, it's, yeah. and then at that, in the next item, you'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be expounding on that, the the pandemic has put us in a position of supply chain issues and our, our lead times on these trucks are way out. We don't, we, finance will come back to the commission for approval of the financing schedule once delivery, we know an exact delivery date is going to occur. So th there's a lot of other things at play, but really it was to answer the question was how much stress we, can we put on the, the rate and this was our strategy. Particularly with items that take a long time to receive. Correct. I mean, it takes a long time to put that truck or chassis together. Oh, okay. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? No comment. Sure. Just, uh, you know, one statement follow-up to that, Bill, because I think that, you know, my understanding, again, the interest rate was good, so this was a better way to go financially for us. But, you know, long-standing debate about not boxing ourselves into one way or the other where, you know, the lease option can be like, oh, well, it's just go it's going to take pressure off. But in the long run, if interest rates, you know, soar, we've boxed ourselves into, okay, well, we're not going to be able to buy these anymore. So, so it can be a short-term gain of pressure on the rates. And in the end, uh, you know, uh, it can hurt us. So I think, again, my understanding is that, that you are keeping all that in mind. We want to be flexible to be able to purchase if it makes sense to purchase. Because, again, it's, it's the long-term effect on the rates. Right. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? All right, this, uh, anybody from the public wish to come forward and speak to this item? All right, seeing none, come back to the commission. Any final comments from anybody on the lease? No. Okay, roll call vote. Vice Mayor Kynes? Aye. Commissioner Torga? Aye. Commissioner Gow? Aye. Commissioner Franey? Aye. Mayor Bajowski? Aye, and that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, and I think I'm signing papers at the end of this. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, and then we have uh, the next item, which goes along with this, the purchase of the three solid waste vehicles. Um, and I guess that's Paul and Bill. Morning, Mayor, Commissioners. Morning. Paul Sanick, Public Works and Utilities Director, and I'm flanked here by uh, Bill Pickram, and we're here to talk about buying some trucks today. So uh, <laughs> Bill's going to give us the, the down and dirty. I'm, I'm just going to kind of paraphrase it a little bit. Um, we're we're uh, scheduled to purchase or 
or request for purchase, uh, two trucks in this fiscal year and one in the next fiscal year. Uh, as Bill alluded to, uh, there are severe su um, supply chain issues. Uh, we were supposed to receive a, a truck last October, and we're still waiting on it. So uh, hence the, the reason to move up the fiscal uh, 24 purchase, or excuse me, the 20, 23 purchase. Um, hopefully we will see all three of these trucks in 23. Uh, I'm at this point in time, I, I'm not so hopeful, but we need to get these on the books. Uh, we're also working with the, the fire department and then looking at both stormwater and wastewater and their vector trucks and, and trying to put, get these things kind of lined up a little bit early. Uh, one of the nice things I will say about doing the, the financing part of it is, you know, when we come to you and we ask to purchase a vehicle, we don't have to have the money in the bank at that time. And in this case, it may be, it's, it's going to be a year plus down the road. So I'll push it over to Bill and let him give you all the uh, uh, numbers and trucks and everything else that goes along with it. Okie doke. William. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, fellow commissioners. William Pickram, uh, Solid Waste Recycling Division Director. Um, as Paul has alluded to, and I'll try and be quick with my uh, background on this, I'm here today seeking approval for three new frontline garbage trucks for the sum of $930,145.43. Solid Waste Division has it in this fiscal year budget to replace two collection trucks. However, due to the pandemic supply chain issues that is triggering excessive assembly and elite times, that third truck, uh, there is a third truck at play to be included in today's request for purchase, which was earmarked for next year. <clears throat> that we feel, I feel that this is necessary to order that third truck now to avoid a spike in maintenance costs and a likely equipment failures that are equipment fail failures that arise by relying on aged equipment. All our solid waste equipment, especially the frontline trucks, uh, that, that plan is established on a five to eight year expected life cycle for most of that equipment. That. Uh, that is, that is examined yearly though. <clears throat> Purchase specifications for the three vehicles was developed with input from solid waste and the fleet divisions. The, solid, the city was able to obtain contracted pricing for these three vehicles by piggybacking the Florida Sheriff's Association contract. Copies of the three quotes plus a copy of, the purchasing me of a purchasing memo from Mr. Ankney are included in your agenda packet. It's helpful to understand, which we've mentioned already, that solid waste is an enterprise fund and the timing of the, or the replacement cycles for all its frontline equipment are examined each year, and that the funding of those vehicles is not included in the city's overall vehicle replacement program. As an enterprise division, we, we have, we're separate from that for these frontline trucks. As noted in the budget impact sec section of your agenda packet and the corresponding budget amendment transfer forms, the three vehicles will be purchased using debt. It should be noted that uh, payment for these vehicles will be made later or will be made using the, the, the city's master lease agreement just approved. Staff will return to the city commission uh, for approval of a schedule to finance this purchase at a later date after the delivery date is known it's estimated that the debt for these three trucks, which we're up for discussion and approval today, will likely start in two years. That's fiscal year 2024, not next year, but the year after. Vehicles being replaced and will eventually be sent to auction or used for spare parts. All auction proceeds will be deposited back into the Solid Waste Enterprise <clears throat> Fund. Um, staff hereby recommends the approval of the purchase of the three solid waste vehicles from the noted vendors as described herein. Um, I think that pretty much sums up what we're asking today and if, um, open it up for discussion or questions. Thank you, Bill. Okay, questions on the trucks. Mayor? Yes, please. Bill, was electric considered? Yes, it's on our radar. Electric is uh, that choice that, that, that we, wanna, we wanna go. There's a lot of um, things that play with electric. Discussions that are in the industry now and what's happening, particularly in the state of Florida, is some of the electric trucks are now coming into the state, particularly with these types of collection trucks. One of, two, one of them is a, a collection truck that is a sidearm truck. Um, we're, we wanna be a part of it. 
it's, there's a lot of at play with it. We want to make sure that we're doing it with having on the side, on the infrastructure side, having a fuel source. How are we, are we going to be able to um, support the trucks, be able to fuel them, be able to also maintain them? Battery electric powered garbage trucks, it's emerging technology. And what is happening is that we're on the side of it to be a little, much more cautious on it. What we're seeing, what I'm seeing in the industry with these class eight vehicles, these heavy duty trucks in the battery electric um, technology right now that's coming here, there's different types of trucks that are, are, are making its headway. Buses, delivery trucks, long haul trucks. When it comes to a garbage truck, there's two components on it. There's two components that are play with the different type of manufacturers. You have the chassis, which is the, which is the frame in the engine. Then you also have the garbage truck part. So you have a lot of different power draws on these types of trucks that are making it very, very cautious of how we navigate and go into that technology. But electric was, was, um, is on our radar. It's being scrutinized and uh, there's some sit, there's a city up north, city of Ocala, that's being the first player in it in the state and we got all eyes on it. That's Ocala? Mm -hmm. That's a city of Ocala. Sweet. And, and, and do they have a sidearm, you said? Yes. Mm -hmm. They, two years ago, um, they went ahead and they purchased, um, they, they went ahead and purchased five trucks. They took delivery of two to three of those trucks this last summer. And that's a sidearm truck. And to build off of that, it's, it's the first of its kind in this region. It's built by two different, two, the, two, the manufacturers at play is uh, New, Way, New Way Garbage Trucks, which is our vendor on the garbage truck side. The, the other part of it, the frame and the engine, is built by BYD. And that's, that's the hook to this whole process of us, is who is the manufacturer coming in and going to, make the engine and going to electrify it. And BYD see, is the truck that's going in the city of Alcala. It's, it's been in since last summer. That, um, that manufacturer's out in the West Coast in California. And what's really uh, important for us is the reliance and the relationship we have with our truck manufacturers and the support that they have for us in, in the region, in the state. And it's, it's going to be all eyes on that, menu, on that truck to see how much support the city of Ocala gets from those vendors, particularly, particularly BYD, from parts availability, from support with mechanics. All that is at play we have right now with our manufacturer, which is on the chassis side, which is auto car. Uh, th thank you. Uh, it, it certainly is an emerging technology. Uh, and much different than, than a car. I know that PSTA just signed a contract uh, to purchase 60 uh, buses over the next five years uh, that are all electric. Um, so the, the technology is close. I get it. Thank you for, for looking at it. I am surprised that an ASL came first as opposed to a rear loader. I mean, in my mind, a rear loader is a little more simplistic than, than a front loader or a, a side loader. But that's neat. So thank you. For, uh, please keep a tab on Ocala and what they're doing and, and uh, make sure that uh, when every, the industry is comfortable that we are first on the list. So mm -hmm. thank you, Bill. Any other questions? For, yep. Yeah, uh, Bill, you know, just on that simplisticness of the back end loader or rear end loader. So basically that's just because there's no automation on the truck. I mean, basically it's just... I mean, there's some automation, but you don't have a lift. Yeah, you, exactly. It's the hydraulics, basically. Garbage right, 101 <laughs> in collections. You, you're hitting a nerve on that, exactly. With the rear loader, you're doing two functions. You're driving the truck and you're compacting it. The lifting's being done manually. Sidearm truck, front load truck, now you're doing the three functions. The power draw is going to be naturally on the, on the wheels to get you from point A to point B. The lifting of the containers and then the compaction the garbage truck performs. Those three, those three power draws, those three, three functions are at play. And having a sidearm truck in the state is, gonna, is very interesting. So seeing how that unfolds. As opposed to a, back, a backpacker, which I'm seeing much more of those in some of the larger cities out west and up in the northeast, the New Yorks, the Seattles, Los Angeles, where the garbage trucks are going in, 
it's been the backpackers for those reasons that there's the lifting's being done manually, it's driving and it's compacting, taking away the lifting component. So how do we get away from lifting period? Oh boy, that's, uh, that's yeah, something that is. <laughs> is more bodies, <laughs> that'd be more bodies. Yeah. And that's. I mean, is that mostly, you know, yard debris that's in the smaller cans or? Yeah, mm -hmm. with, the level, with the services that we perform, single family home, you get three different service, services and the yard waste is collected manually. Yeah. So if there is a truck that I would see, the ideal would be either a claw truck or a backpacker. But again, if it's a sidearm truck, those are those are at play with us as well. So, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes, I do. Um, so I appreciate your input about that. This this concept of side or or back, we all understand that, and that's pretty simple to understand. Um, you know, one one requires less labor, and one is one is for speed, and but it has a big draw. The the other real question, it really is uh, hydraulic uh, uh, hydrogen. Um, and other fuels. Um, do, you, do you mind just giving us a quick update on that? Now, BYD is one of the leaders, and that was a Chinese company, and they're, they're making a lot of the buses, et cetera, that, that are being utilized today. It's a major, major uh, um, uh, company that's involved in this, and they do have their, they do have their build spots now here in, in the U.S. But what about the, what about the fuel question? Um, hydrogen? Uh, are we anywhere with that? Are we anywhere with the other kinds of fuel as opposed to the electric issue? The, uh, the, other, the technology that I'm seeing for, al for alternative fuel sources for the, to power a garbage truck, um, compressed natural gas has been at play for a while, mm -hmm. and that's, you're seeing much more of that mm -hmm. before electric, uh, battery electric has been uh, come into, uh, into our industry. Um, there's also been out there hybrid trucks that they're in that category with energy that you get from breaking a truck. And a lot of our trucks break every 15, 20 feet if they're going house to house. So there's been energy there. And it would essentially, can, to a degree, it would catapult the truck from stop to stop, reducing the reliance on a fuel, on an energy source. That has been at play, but I haven't, you know, we haven't had much of it in the region and that technology, except for CNG, which is probably much more stronger with the, the amount of trucks in our industry. Those are the types of alternative fuel sources or alternative fuel technology that I'm seeing in our industry. It just so happens that diesel has also come a long way with the emissions, the, the low amount of emissions. It's a lot of things coming into play with us is really is the technology in our industry, the size of our operations, and the reliance on other things is what can we do to support it from keeping us running with the mechanics, with the, the facility we have in our fueling station. I, I'm not quite sure if I hit directly your question, but you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of other, there's three other options. And that's, we're, we're, look, we're entertaining them, but the battery electric is really in having much more of a the timing of this with what's going on outside of our division with the Ready for 100 and the Dream, we're going to be very involved in and we're going to be players in that and be a part of those teams to be able to make sure that we are shifting with where we can be with, with uh, our solid waste division. We're 50% of, of the customer for the fleet division, uh, fleet division next door. So we have, we have the rolling stock, we burn the most fuel mm -hmm. in our entity. So, we're a part of it, and it's just going to have to be a part of the, it's, it's going to be a process. Now, we've got, there's trucks around here in our, in our community that are running on, on uh, compressed natural gas, correct? That's correct. Do we, if we, if, because we've been talking about this for a number of years now, and of course, sometimes you can always wait and wait and wait and wait and wait and see what happens. But the question is, are we going to be in, fall within that requirement that we, or the commitment that we've made? Um, for uh, alter, alternate fuels. So, I, you know, we keep bringing it up and we keep asking. So, the last question maybe is about the pricing of this. Um, before, it was quite a, quite a bit more. Um, that's, I, it, from my information that I have, it's, it's, it's starting to draw closer um, to what's, what's occurring with the, with the diesels. Um, can you give us any, any input about that? 
the um, here's where some price points are with the trucks that we bought today that we bought in the past. The sidearm truck that we're buying today, um, them I'm requesting to buy today. Last year at this time, that truck we we also we purchased is 12 percent more now from one year ago. Um, the sidearm truck that we're buying is $374,000. City of Ocala, those, the truck price that they paid for the electric truck two years ago when they cut a, the purchase order was about uh, a little over half a million dollars, $550,000, $60,000. That's pre-pandemic price. I'm sure that price has increased. It has come down. Five years ago, electrifying a, a garbage truck, million dollar truck. But there's other mechanisms, there's other money at play that can be had at that. Ocala tapped into an EPA grant that funded about 28% of the truck. There's requirements of that, of that grant and that you know need to be much more scrutinized, but there's funding sources to help you get there. Um, that grant happened to be a grant, it's a, a Diesel Emissions Reduction Act grant, you know, and it really had a lot at play at that with their decision to do this, so. So how about compressed natural gas or, or you know, uh, I won't use the initials so that everybody understands what we're talking about, and, and hydrogen. Where, 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 where are they in those price points now? I can't speak on the hydrogen technology in a, in a garbage truck, but the compressed natural gas, you, on average, you're going to pay about 15 to 20% more uh, for the price tag of a garbage truck. The other part that is at play at that is um, having the facility to be able to work on that truck, having... Um, um, mechanics trained in that technology and the support and then the fueling source. I mean, we have a fueling station over in, um, off of Hercules or, um, the Clearwater gas has one. I, I believe it's on Belcher road. And that's one that many, the ones that compress natural gas, a lot of those trucks fuel there. There's, there, there's, um, that's where we're at was about 15 to 20% more. Thank you. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. It's, it's good to understand too. Our, our contractor, Waste Pro, they have their trucks, a couple of their trucks in town are compressed natural gas. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody from the public wish to come forward and speak to this item? Okay. Um, I need a motion to approve this contract. So move. Second. Second. Okay, Commissioner Franey and Vice Mayor Kynes, thank you. Any final comments from anybody? Nope. All right, uh, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Then we have the proposed agenda for February 1st. Um, Nikki, I think you had some additions yes, you wanted to do. I do have an addition, um, Mayor and Commissioners. If it be acceptable, there's a few items and going through the remaining chapters of the city code recommendations from the ORC that I have some questions about and need to seek your direction on before I can finalize the ordinances. So I have the chapters and I can get them to Rebecca, but if we could add that on as a discussion and possible direction item, I would appreciate it for that meeting. Sure. Everyone's good like with that? It's not okay. a long meeting. Yeah, I figured it looked like one that might be sure. a good opportunity to get. And, and there's just been some updates in, in time and, um, and in your city attorney position and a few other things that may have just, I wanna make sure that you're, um, that we talk about the direction before finalizing the ordinances. So. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so with those additions, can I have a motion to approve? So moved. Thank you. Commissioner Kynes, or Vice Mayor Kynes and uh, Commissioner Gow, thank you. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. What I thought we would do is go ahead and go through the Juneteenth discussion and then take a break before we get into the dream. Okay? And Mayor, I may have to step out just briefly at 10 a.m., but you all feel free to do, continue your discussion. I it's think a, we can live without you. Okay. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you guys will, I know, you'll be fine. I just wanted, I didn't want you to be alarmed, but I just wanted you to know I just have to step Don't out at worry. 10 a.m. for a few minutes. Thank you. Teresa, finally. <laughs> Poor gal. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Commission. Uh, Teresa Smalling, Director of HR and Risk Management for the city to talk about the Juneteenth holiday. Uh, 
Just some background, on June 17, 2021, President Biden signed a bill making Juneteenth a federal holiday. It is the first new federal holiday since MLK Day in 1983. Um, this, the MLK Day was approved by the City Commission as of August 2007 as an official city holiday. Uh, just um, for those people that may not understand what Juneteenth means, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed by President Abraham Lincoln January 1st, 1863, but it wasn't until uh, June 19th, 1865, that the word officially got to the slaves that they were indeed free. And it came in Texas. Um, the Union uh, Major General um, landed in Texas and let the slaves there know that. And that's kind of why Texas has it as a national holiday. Um, the, June, the, the, the whole spirit behind Juneteenth is to celebrate African-American freedom and achievement and while encouraging continuous self-development and respect for all cultures. So it, you know, it, it is a, a celebration um, of African-American freedom, but it is also for everyone who's considered American, who calls himself American. Um, just a few more points. In 1991, you know, Florida has, has um, acknowledged Juneteenth. Uh, there is a Florida Statute Bill 68321 in which the, the, the House um, enacted to, to just recognize that day every year. And uh, last year, Governor DeSantis sent out a proclamation. The statute says that the governor shall make a proclamation every year, and they call upon all cities throughout Florida to recognize the day. So this is not necessarily new to Florida. There are various cities since the president um, made it a federal holiday that have now acknowledged it as the city, uh, city or county holiday notably Hillsborough County, Clearwater, Gulfport, and St. Petersburg. Uh, in the packet that I sent out, um, I put together a, a little cheat sheet, if you will, of suggestions of ways that uh, Juneteenth can be celebrated throughout the community and in the city. Uh, one of the suggestions, of course, was to make it a, a city holiday, but um, you know, sometimes with a holiday, and our employees may hate me for saying this, but sometimes with a holiday, it becomes a day to buy a new mattress or a new car. So, you know, knowing that there are a lot of people that don't really understand what Juneteenth is, Juneteenth is all about, one of the suggestions is to have some kind of in-service day, some kind of community event where we, as a city, recognize Juneteenth um, and the importance of it to our community as a whole. At this time, I'll take any questions that you may have. Okay, so Teresa, just to be clear, and this is also part of the, um, I'm sure the UNITE committee. Yes, the United uh, Task Force, Employee Task Force did this, discussed it, and um, the consensus was um, it, it could be made a holiday, uh, but also to have some kind of community events to, to, so people understand exactly what this date is all about. Okay, any questions for uh, Teresa? Um, sure. Teresa, um, Dr. Smalling, you might want to um, tell people what United means. I don't think we've said it today. <laughs> okay. So uh, United um, is an initiative that was directed by City Commission and, and City Commission to really, um, once again, revive what uh, was important to our community, diversity and inclusion. And it, it stands for Unite Neighbors in Thoughtfulness and Empathy the Needed. And so this employee task force was put together in order to um, get uh, the, the framework, the guidelines for an advisory committee to a citizen advisory committee to the commission to talk about um, uh, topics of diversity and inclu inclusion in the Dunedin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? I have a couple. Okay. Um, 
do we have other in-service dates? Not, not citywide, no. Okay. And um, the paid ho uh, employee holiday estimate cost, how was that, got, how was that calculated? Uh, we actually did have a calculation, and <laughs> I was hoping to get it before this meeting, which is funny because this is the third time we're trying to do this. It's on there. Um, <laughs> it's on there at 37000 There we go. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> no, 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 I asked how it was calculated. Right. Oh, so, you know, you basically, that would be a payroll question, but my thought would be you take the um, average hourly um, salaries of employees and calculate it out. I think... Actually, Paula took a holiday and just calculated what we, we pay for a holiday. Okay. I mean, how many employees do we have? We have uh, about 350 and then, you know, 20 or so um, seasonal employees. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious because it looked like maybe it took an average hourly and then but basically didn't put in anything there for all the, you know, the holiday pay for fire and water and wastewater and those kind of things. So it just seemed low to me. Um, I, I don't think I have any other questions. Okay, questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to try to limit this just to questions and then I've got some comments later. So if you would, please. Um, I know that you're requesting or staff has requested that we as a commission discuss the options um, and get a consensus direction for commemorating uh, Juneteenth uh, in the city of Dunedin. Um, and as I considered the subject, um, I began with some really basic questions um, and developed others, and so some of those are, are herein. Uh, so the compensation, the commemoration, and the, the paid holiday, which is the compensation side of this, are they mutually exclusive? I heard you say that perhaps they're not. So by that, what I'm saying, if anybody doesn't understand, is we could have a commemoration and or we could have a commemoration and a paid holiday or have a paid holiday and not a commemoration, any one of those combinations that were, I guess, then voted on. Is that, is that kind of correct? Yes, I mean, you could have a comm commemoration on another day and then have the holiday, or you could just use that holiday to commemorate. You have people, have employees come to work, but maybe have it as an in-service day where they're not outward facing, but inward facing. So was the commemoration chosen first, or was the paid holiday chosen first or in a major consideration? I think they were sort of in concert with each other. For example, um, we commemorate MLK Day on Saturday, but then it's a holiday on Monday. So I think that might have been the thought process there if we're going to do it both. So being mutually exclusive, the, the, the first consideration was, hey, what do we want to do for this holiday? And then later, a request was made to make this a paid holiday f for the employees, is that? It, uh, it, a, a recommendation, they were just recommending that it could be a paid holiday, but you know, if, if we were very aware that sometimes when you have this holiday, nobody really understands the significance of it. So there was that concern of making sure that people understood what the holiday was all about. So in, in making that definition then, or, or providing that information, th this meeting was really only about Juneteenth. It wasn't about any other, any other holidays or any other commemorations or any other issues. It was only about Juneteenth. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, I have some other questions then. Um, I went through the financials uh, that, that, you, that you reported to us, the cost, and, uh, and so just to make it real easy for, for communication, because I'm not sure that that number is close or correct. Um, and so uh, let's just say that, let's just play with it a little bit. So if we had, if we had 378 employees um, and, and we're, we're saying that this is gonna cost 37,831, um, there's a, there is, I, I believe, sort of a problem with that number. Um, it seems to be extremely low. 
Um, and it brings out another question. Um, are, we, are we including a full boat? That's an expression we used to use, a full boat meant you have all your employees. Sometimes you don't, sometimes you do, but a full boat is you have, a, have all of your employees. Does that include a full boat, or, or does that just include a, a, a snapshot at a particular time of how many employees we had? Well, keep in mind the way that we, not on a holiday, not everyone has the day off. For example, Monday, we have um, shifts. So we have some employees that work Monday through Thursday and some that work Tuesday through Friday. In some of our departments, the employees that work Monday through, Tuesday through Thursday, when the holiday falls on a Monday, they basically flip the day. So they would still have the regular day off on Monday, but then they also get Tuesday off. So the, the calculation is not a straight everybody time, you know, everybody's hours times their hourly rate for that day. It just depends on who's would have been working that day that you calculate the holiday for. I don't know if that helps. Uh, because that, that, that uh, calculation is, is equal to about $12.50 an hour. Um, if you had the full boat, but if you don't have the full boat, like you're saying, there's there's other numbers that are in there. Mm -hmm. um, what happens to what happens to people that just out of curiosity, um, how how much of a full boat do we have right now? You may have to define full boat for me a little bit better. Okay. So in other words, that you have all your positions full. Mm -hmm. Well, not really, but okay. So. Um, we, we have about 30 vacancies right now, so we don't have all our positions. Our variable on-demand employees, not all of them work full-time and a full schedule, so you may have, um, maybe that Monday, you wouldn't have any variable on-demand employees or a few variable on-demand employees working. So, um, so that snapshot has to be defined as to when it was taken and, and, and what it really means. Okay, so I, I, guess, I guess we're saying maybe that number is close and maybe it's not. We're, we're not sure. It's close It's because if you take MLK Day, that's, that's a Monday holiday. So, you know, if you figure out how much we pay out on MLK, then that's close. And that's the, um, the estimate that I got from our payroll person. It is an estimate. It's not. So, Jennifer, are you confident that this is pretty close? Yeah, we, as, as, I mean, I'm sure said, you wouldn't have provided it that way if it wasn't. We, we took another holiday, plugged in that number, is about 37,000. Okay, thank you. Is that fully burdened? That number? I'm sorry, Commissioner, what does fully burdened? Um, uh, fully burdened is when you take the, the total cost of, of an employee. So, uh, so some people use 1.6, 1.8 of whatever that whatever that uh, that pay that that salary is to include the cost of insurance and, and everything else i'm not sure that we went that far i'd have to check if we factored in fica and um medicare just but i could get back with you on that so th there's some questions about that number anyway nevertheless so so I let's don't let's just clarify though this is just for discussion purposes we're not voting today so Y'all can come back with, I mean, it's likely not going to be over 50, you know, so it's a range. It's just a, an example of what it might cost, so you can get us that information in the yes, future, sure. right? Well, what you just said, I'm, I have to question that. We're going to give a consensus here, are we not? Well, we're going to give a, con I'm, I'm presuming, consensus I could direction. be wrong, but I'm presuming we're going to give some directions on which things to pursue and then bring back to us for a final something, right? Correct. Yeah. So I'm looking for some specific good information before I can give that consensus. Okay. No, I get it, but I'm just saying I don't think the, I don't, I don't personally believe that the dollar difference of 30, I mean, I don't, A, I don't think you weren't going to come forward with a bad number. That's your opinion. And I, and no, I, it is my opinion, but I mean, it's based on experts in the field. And I, and I do think that, you know, whether it's 38 or 45, it's not going to make that big of a difference as to are we giving a empl paid employee holiday. I think that's the concept here from a policy perspective because that's all this is, is a policy thing. That's your opinion? 
Thank you very much. You're welcome. And I'm giving mine, okay? And I'm just I'm trying to establish what we really know about what this cost is. And so I've, I've done that, I think, to my satisfaction at this point. Um, what happens to the employees that, that, that aren't working during that time period or that are off on a holiday? What happened? Just out of curiosity, I'm just curious, since you gave a number. Okay, Do so if it was, if they would have normally been off on that day is what you're asking. So they either, what happens most of the time is that they get to flip another day. So, for example, they could have some of them off on Tuesday, some off on Wednesday, just to make sure, you know, operation stays, you know, we don't have any adverse effect on operations. And I think you made a, you made a good point talking about what happens when, when some of those people are working, because some of them will, will work. And if we're thinking we're giving a holiday to the employees, well, some of them for a purpose, mm -hmm. some of them are actually going to be working. Mm -hmm. Well, we do have, when you work the holiday, you get extra pay. No, I'm not talking about pay then. I'm mm -hmm. talking about the concept of allowing them to have some options of celebrating that day. Mm -hmm. and, and some of them may be working depending on, on how much of, a, of an input <laughs> that we give. Yes. I love that. You, you were very, <laughs> very cool. Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. What, what is our procedure for, for selecting holidays in, uh, in Dunedin? Do you, do you know that, or is there a procedure, or are we following a procedure? Honestly, I don't know, because the last time a holiday was uh, approved by the commission was 2007, which predates me, but I could find out if you need me to go back and look. Uh, uh, that's interesting. Um, I, I, I found, I, I, just looking at your notes here, I found something else interesting, I thought, in, in looking at, at the celebration of this particular day. And I noticed in, in uh, the governor's um, communication here, and I'm going to cut back on some of my questions now, but um, you made a comment, and, and I just want to, I want to bring this out. In one of his whereases, he says, uh, he talks about the emancipation in Florida was proclaimed in Tallahassee on May 20. 1865. Mm -hmm. That, by the way, was General McCook who raised the flag over our capital, mm -hmm. stating the Union flag, stating that hey, you are now a United, you are a United States again, and we won the war in May. Mm -hmm. So it's, and he goes on and says, and for and for this. A Florida, Flor, Floridians traditionally celebrated Emancipation Day on May 20. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I found that interesting. I also looked at some of the other interesting dates that apply to this. So um, perhaps, perhaps a little more input on, on, on this Juneteenth. Some of that comes from some of the people that I spoke with because um, I asked a lot of people the question, this question um, about this subject matter. And a lot of them said, well, that's a Texan date. That's what happened in Texas. Well, it did. On June 19, another general, General Granger, went in and, and did the same concept of what, of what happened here in Florida and stated that, hey, we are now a, you are now a member of, 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 our, of our union, and therefore you have to follow our rules which I can go off on that for a long time because that's a very, very interesting subject matter. Uh, it involves nullification. It involves one of the reasons for the Civil War, why the Civil War started. Uh, there were four major reasons. Um, and that nullification was the fact that, that Texas couldn't do what they wanted to do. They now had to do what, they, what, what was required. So um, I just found that interesting, those two different dates in there and how now we're, we're, we're grabbing the Texas date. Um, so for me, I was just curious. Um, the the uh, general question um, is, did, did, you cons did we consider any of the other dates that apply to the subject matter? Not that that's terribly important to me, but um, as a student of history and a student of our, our good old U.S. Uh, US of A and, and some of the issues that have occurred within our country, um, having toured uh, too many of these battlefields, 
both both from a, a military standpoint as well as from my personal standpoint, having walked them and crawled them and the whole nine yards. Um, it's a very personal thing for me, and so that's why I'm asking just some of these questions. But some of these came up in in the information that that I was given by people when I asked how, how they felt about this and how they felt about an additional holiday. Um, did you did you want me to answer that question, Commissioner? Or? Sure, sure, if you'd like to, that would okay. be great. So keep in mind that this whole discussion started because President Biden declared Juneteenth, June 17th, 2021, as, or well, June 19th, sorry, but he declared Juneteenth to be a federal holiday. I think if the president had not declared Juneteenth to be a federal holiday, I would not be sitting here with you unless the commission said we'd like to look at other holidays. So I think that's the bottom line. The, 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 the pivot of this whole discussion is the fact that this is now a federal holiday. So then the question comes up of does the city want to go ahead and acknowledge this also as a holiday for the city or do we just want to go with along with what the governor does where he just does a proclamation every year for the same event. I hope that helps. No, no I, I thank you very much. That's, that's excellent. Um, the, of course, as you just pointed out, the federal government made this a, a, a federal holiday. And um, the, actually, the, our governor went along with that. Our governor then gave the, pro, gave the proclamation for that date, although he did include that part about the 20th. And I was just curious to see if you guys had looked at that. Um, the, um, the, the Emancipation Proclamation uh, is, is, uh, is certainly a, a, another date um, here and that and that's really why I was asking because that's that's really what changed that horrible um, Shall I say horrendous deadly destructive war that that our country went through um, with, with just far too many far too many people having having died in, in combat uh, An equivalency by the way of almost six million of our of, of our population today in the Second World War, we lost 404, but that's neither said here nor there. Um, the commemoration, um, it seems an excellent one um, as it relates to what, what occurred during that time period. Um, the, regardless of perhaps even what date you use or anyone uses, um, is, is, is the commemoration, is that, is, is that, is that sufficient? Is that correct? Is that good uh, by itself? I, I think any acknowledgement of what the day means is, is useful, is, is helpful. And I, I just want to quickly comment on something that um, in, in night, the, the statute that put enacted um, Juneteenth in Florida um, happened in 1991. So the governor's proclamation is just following that, that statute because the statute, and it's in the packet, does say that the governor may issue annually a proclamation designating June 19th as Juneteenth Day. Um, so there is the recognition that May 20th is considered Emancipation Day in Florida, but Juneteenth Day is considered, uh, they call it Freedom Day. Um, I think maybe the thought is that in May, Florida f slaves were declared free, but in June, June 19th, all slaves were declared free. And maybe that's the best way to look at this. No, and I appreciate that. And I'm too much into history, but for me, the nullification, the reason for the, actually the, our, our, our own, our own, uh, our, our very own whole establishment of our constitution came from home rule, the desire for home rule. And, and I'm looking at this and saying, well, we're Dunedin. Um, perhaps we have a different call on this. Uh, we could, we, and I was just asking if we, if, if we thought about that. And that was, that was the purpose of that question. Um, so as far as, as far as the questions go, um, I, I think I'll, 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 I'll leave it at, at that for now. And uh, thank you for responding on that on that number and just giving an idea that was just a just a rough number used. 
Um, as you know, I'm financially uh, oriented and I'm, I'm fiscal, I have a, a strong requirement for fiscal responsibility. So I had to ask that question. You can understand that, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jennifer, you've gone over this with Teresa, correct? Yes. Um, and the, the concept that's been brought forward were several options. Mm -hmm. And you all have not made a call as to which options should be, right? But you probably have a, a sense of what you'd like to do. I do. Okay. Would I you do. like to tell us? I, I'd like to do number four, the employee in service day. Okay. And, and the reason for that, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commissioners, is to, as, as Commissioner Frayner brought up, we don't have one in-service day for the general employees. We do have in-service days in departments, but not for the general employees. It is a way for us to commemorate the day and also to, to work on our continuous self-development within the city to, uh, to capitalize upon an opportunity to educate on diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion in all facets of, of right. life, really. And um, we also, I would like to do some sort of a community service in the afternoon or you know, part of the morning. And the reason for that is that we've been trying to, to as employees, uh, reach out to the community, find out where there are needs, and expend employee efforts to the city of Dunedin in those areas. But it's difficult to do on a weekend because if you're an hourly employee, then we've got to pay you and, and so on and so forth. And so this is really an opportunity for us to get out into the community as the city of Dunedin to help our community as well. So um, nobody else is doing it this way. Nobody else is doing it either. From our research, uh, they were going to commemorate um, there are some cities that are just doing nothing, and there are some cities that are off for the day. I didn't think that just a, a day off uh, is something that would really serve us or support us or support <clears throat> our community. We need to take a, a you know, this is, a, I, I believe, a, a unique opportunity for us to, to educate our employees as a group about what diversity, inclusion, and, and equity means. And so... Um, I would really, I, I would support the, the in-service day. There is, there is a cost associated with the in-service day because we would need to close down you know, some of our facilities. I'd like to get a, a speaker who's well-trained um, in, in organizations like ours um, and how we, we you know, approach diversity within our workforce. Um, and um, you know, we have an employee uh, fair showcasing various cultures. We could do something like that. Depending upon the direction of the city commission this morning, uh, Teresa and I could work up a program um, um, and um, and bring it back for you if you'd like, as far as what that would look like. Um, you know, any one of these four, and in fact, a fifth is is do nothing as well. That's an option before the city commission as well. But I just, as I said, I just think this is a this is a, a, a really good opportunity for us to, as a municipal corporation, serve our community. And. Did you have an opinion on the community events? Because I don't think any of these are mutually exclusive. No. Well, I think, I think uh, you know, the community events we could certainly do. Um, you know, I don't know if we, we need to put on another community event. Yeah, can, I, can I comment there? Is that okay? Yeah, I was just going to ask you. I mean, I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but it, I don't, having another community event, you know, would be challenging. Mm -hmm. It's also, you know, about the same time that we have Pride Week events. So it potentially, so I'm just wondering, is there a reason that the education and the celebration can't kind of merge with the Martin Luther King things that we do, so to speak? Would that be, a, a, would that make sense as a merger or is that very so different, the themes or? Um, thinking outside the box, I mean, you know, the, I guess the only thought is one's in January, one's in June, but you could make it, uh, you know, kind of like how we do the diversity, we call it diversity week. Right, right, yeah. we're celebrating diversity week mm -hmm. then, so it kind of seems to follow that same flair without kind of creating another, you know, five months later, another event or six months later. Mm -hmm. It was just a thought, because I, that's what I thought, it's like, it, you know, so many events, sometimes you, you lose, you lose rather than gain. Which well, and I, and I wasn't saying we should, I was just trying mm -hmm. to understand, yeah, you have that. item one through four, Right. you know, I, I just wanted to get Jennifer's opinion. What is she real? You know, these are all our options, but you know, frankly, it's other than any money spent, it's an administrative decision. Mm 
And so I don't want to go too deep into that. I want you guys to do your thing. Um, so your your personal feeling at this point, or your professional sorry, your professional opinion at this point is do the in service day and go from there. Yes. Okay. You had a question. Uh, well, actually, it, it was sort of a question because I'm thinking, you know, because, you know, I can't... Well, let's definitely keep it to questions because I want to open to the public. This was a question. Okay. Well, it's sort of a question. No, just kidding. Well, I'm just saying we... <laughs> just kidding. It was a joke. <laughs> we want to hear from the public before we make determinations. Mm -hmm. Okay. The question is, why was June 19th chosen and it's probably because that that was the farthest outreach that they finally reached, you know, to let people know that there was no longer slavery in the United States. Is that true or false historically? That was a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, as I said before, that, that is my thought, that, you know, there were pockets where it was, you know, being spread, but I, I think that was the final, final time when the dec it was said this is in fact true that slavery is now ended in America, and it just it happened in Texas. Any other questions before I open up to the public? Anybody from the public wish to speak to this item? There's yeah, one come on down. Give us your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes. Um, my name is Christy Spencer, and um, I don't live in Dunedin, but I am a third-generation native Floridian, and Dunedin is part of my home. Sure. Um, I just wanted to say, because I didn't know they were doing something like this, but um, I come to most of the events they have here in Dunedin who doesn't love Dunedin? Mm -hmm. It's like the example of the county, the example of the state. And um, I see people out here that this means so much to them to come to events. Certainly to add something as significant as this event would be is going to be a plus for you. Um, it's going to bring more people in. It's going to allow more people to see how much fun it is to be a part of the Dunedin community. And I think you will see people investing, more people investing in going to the restaurants, uh, going to the marketplace. Um, I don't see anything negative about something like this. And certainly to go with Jennifer's ideas here, this is, this is going to be a wonderful thing for the Dunedin community. That's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. I, I had one more question, though, I did, I, that I'm sorry I forgot about. And that's the, um, because under community events, what you have listed here are all different kinds of ideas and not necessarily community-wide Right. festivals, mm -hmm. but like encouraging the displays in the library, the Fine Arts Center, the History Museum, which I think is already somewhat happening today, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> asking them to make a specific, uh, uh, that's easy. Mm -hmm. That really is easy and is very reflective of the community because you might go in any one of those places the entire month, you know what I mean? Um, so those kinds of things, right? The, that's an easy thing. Right. That's not a... And even the art in the park that they do. Mm -hmm. You know, they just change it up a little bit. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so really what you're looking for now, you're saying you like the idea of the in-service day? I do. Okay, and unless anybody has some other <clears throat> idea, well, you're asking for at least approval of that. Consensus direction, yet. Yeah, yeah and, or consensus direction, and then any other ideas anybody else has, yes. right? Yes, Okay. Yes, ma'am. Well, when I talk to Jennifer, and now this is not a question, right? I, no, no, you're, you're, you're beyond that. Now, now we're in the discussion wrap debate. Wrap myself in ropes trying to make a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you know, I, I definitely think the in-service day is an excellent idea. Then I would look at, you know, I said we usually do an employee um, picnic, 
and maybe we could have something like that that day also. And But I think, I totally agree that diversity, equity, and inclusion is a very important part of the fabric of our city, our state, and our nation. So I'm willing to send that back to you all, let you all figure the most appropriate way. I think that's a great idea to work with the Art Center, the History Museum, uh, the Chamber, I mean, to, so that we can reflect this thought in our other institutions <clears throat> here in Dunedin. Commissioner? Uh, I believe the significance of Juneteenth, not that I'm an expert, was that Texas was the last state and the importance of this is the fact that it is something that unites us as the United States. Certainly each individual state acknowledged it as we went through, but it finally got to Texas. So that's the reason there's a difference between Florida and Texas. And so it's important that we unite with the rest of the nation and celebrate it in, in June, in Juneteenth, as opposed to when Florida. So that's just kind of my thought on that. Um, I have, as far as the, the different things that we could do, I think it's, it's wonderful that we're even discussing this the, uh, this morning. Uh, I've actually worked for a company that uh, closed for a day, and it was an in-service day. <clears throat> All the employees came, and we used it. It wasn't specifically for things like that, although this was part of it, but it was anything that has to do with the company. Um, inclusion, customer service, all that sort of stuff, and it was just a great bonding opportunity at a minimum for staff to get together that wasn't work-specific, skill-related, specific. And so it's a great opportunity for the, for, the, um, <clears throat> for the employees to bond. It's a great opportunity to learn something of the same thing. It's a great opportunity for us to, at least within our own city family, to keep something active and alive and to keep these discussions going. Absolutely correct. I think if we were just to have a day off, it's just a day off that it's a chance to go to the beach or to rake the yard or whatever you do. And so the meaning of the day off gets lost, which I think is totally true for a lot of the holidays that we have today. You know, the importance of Labor Day or any of the other uh, holidays that we have, it just kind of gets lost and we all do our own thing. So this is an opportunity for us to at least be true to ourselves, be true to um, uh, the different cultures and the diversity in, in the community uh, to certainly uh, give breath and support and teeth to um, our in-house in uh, city activism of, of Unite uh, Dunedin. And so I think the overall concept is, is good. And to get down to it, I do support the, the in-service today for the reasons I acknowledged. Thank you. Commissioner? So, um, yeah, I like the direction it's going. I think uh, an in-service day is appropriate. I, I, I think, Jeff, you were saying this. Maybe I'm wrong, but, you know, it doesn't, doesn't have to just be diversity. Diversity, you know, it's an education there, but it can also be in-service on things like customer service Absolutely. that are important issues. Right. Absolutely. Because you don't get the time to do that kind of thing right. as, a, as a city. So I think it has all, and, and, of course, any good customer service, you know, builds in the theory of, being all inclusive, I think. So I think uh, you can you can do other areas. Um, I, I love the idea of uh, part of the day being community service in some way. I think that's awesome. Um, you know, when I was at the county, they they did have an in service couple in service days. I think one big one, and um, it was always helpful. You just don't get a chance to bond as a group if you don't take that uh, take that time off. Um, uh, I um, I think number one is a given. The proclamation acknowledging significance. So every year we would do that. Uh, 3F to me is a given, which is encouraged displays. I think you're right. That's an easy one, but it's a way that, you know, the different organizations that we have recognize it, which helps educate. And then, um, you know, and I'm for thinking about this MLK Juneteenth merge of education at the MLK date, you know, just kind of merge that thought process and, you know, potentially that kind of uh, helps that event even be better. And, uh, uh, and it doesn't tax, um, you know, our rec and park staff because they're very taxed. Um, so I think that achieves all the goals. Um, you know, a holiday's great, but I, I agree with everything that's been said. I think sometimes it just, it's a day off, but it doesn't really, it doesn't really help the education piece and some other goals that I think are more important. So 
Um, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Commissioner Tonga? Thank you. Um, in concert with what you were just talking about, I think your comments before and, and just recently about uh, Martin Luther King Day um, is that um, it, it's also seen as a day to promote uh, equal rights uh, for all Americans, uh, regardless of what our backgrounds are. And that's, that's the ultimate in unity, and that's what we, we need to have unity, and that's for certain. There is a, there is a federal day that's set aside for in-service day, and that's 9-11. Um, we already have that. It's not a, certainly not a holiday, um, but that's a day of service. That's been established. Um, I want to make a couple of comments, if I may, then. Um, as a commissioner, I, I, I do try to pass along um, upcoming things to individuals, get consideration from them, how they feel about things. And, and I'll go ahead and report this. Uh, when asked, the responses were generally the same. From, and I asked a, here's another expression from a boat, a boatload of questions and a boatload of people. Um, and here's the response I got back. Let's not add another paid holiday. Um, number two, do what the state, law, state has done I uh, use a commemoration, a commemoration uh, for for uh, for that particular day. Given that there are so many other days, um, and another one was um, were other days considered? How about the the Indigenous Americans? Um, do do we have a day set aside for that? The, it is on a federal calendar. It's not a federal holiday, um, but it is set aside. Uh, we we live on the lands. We live on the lands that are of the Tokobaga, um, who disappeared after the, after the Spaniards came. And then, of course, we ended up with Seminoles here. But um, we have recognized 570 tribes. Um, I would support that, Commissioner, if you were to bring that forward. I'm sorry? I would support that idea if you were to bring that forward. So, um, Me too. So a, a couple other things were only, uh, only a couple su uh, suggested or supported even adding uh, uh, another co uh, commemoration or another holiday. Um, they were happy with what we had, happy with what's on calendars, happy with where we stand, can't even keep track of what state, federal, and what, and even what their own city holidays are, um, but felt, felt like they were happy with what they had. Um, most did not support adding this particular holiday or any holiday. When, when, when some of them brought up, well, do we have a Scottish holiday? Uh, do we have, we're Scottish um, here in, in Dunedin, should we, no, no, we don't want that. We don't want to have another holiday. Um, there were other considerations that included, um, here's one from someone, he said, this was a he, he said, cancel all your holidays, cancel all of them, pick 10, let's do 10, don't ever add any more, we're done with the holidays. It's too confusing, it's too, we can have days, you could have a, you could have a commemoration day of, for example, this action, and we could bring people, as the, as the person I gave input in, into the city here because we're commemorating that particular day or many other days. There are many other days um, that are not holidays or, not, or aren't even commemorated uh, by us that are significant. Um, how about our Constitution? world famous. Um, the financial responsibility came up and, and when, asked, when asked what I thought it might cost us, um, I gave a number. I gave what number was given to me in this, in this presentation uh, and then I said I think it might be more than that but it would also depend on what we try to do in that given time period. Um, another comment pretty much by everyone was uh, Again, let's not add any more paid. Let's focus on the work at hand, um, and we're in for and, and let's let's service our community and our municipality the best that we can. And they've kind of felt we we've fallen back a little bit on that because of certain things that have happened, COVID, et cetera. There are other concerns about the continuation of of, of COVID, uh, and the impact of what COVID has had, but then also perhaps based on some issues that we have at the federal government, which may include our debt load um, uh, and the like, and some things that are occurring currently, inflation, et cetera. Um, so um, lastly, um, 
they suggested when we discussed what our holidays are to, to a number of them. They suggested if you want to do this holiday, you already can have that because we already have. Um, the, the city manager has, has a day that they can use for a particular holiday. Once you get a holiday on your list, you'll never get, you can't, you'll always keep that. When do we, when do we get rid of a holiday? You don't get rid of a holiday. And, they, and so they, when that came up to those that discussed that with me, they liked that idea. Let the city manager use her holiday on that given day. Um, as some holidays go, sometimes we lose, we lose the impact of them. We lose the effectiveness of them. Um, they just become something that someone said they go and buy a mattress. Um, let's 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 not allow that to happen. Let's not add more holidays for that. That was the that was that was some of the input that uh, that I got when when I talked with these folks. So based on based on the imp information that I have, I'm not for having a holiday at this point in time. I understand that these two groups that met when you asked them. If somebody asked them, would you like to have a holiday? I've run companies. If I asked the company or everybody in the company, do you want to have a holiday? Paid, if you want to have a paid company holiday, what do you suppose the vote would be? I mean, it's just common sense. I mean, it's just natural. It would be natural. It would be 100% or close. So, and they're making a recommendation to us, and they're the very ones that would be receiving a holiday, and they don't even know what it is. So. Um, I'm just not for ha having, a, having a paid holiday for that period. I am for allowing and having a commemoration, certainly certainly uh, acknowledging that time period if we wish. There's a lot of other time periods that I would like to see. I heard a comment over here that was uh, one for the for indigenous uh, uh, Americans, which by the way is, uh, I always tell everyone is where the name Indian came from, the first part of indigenous and the last part of Americans. And, uh, and we pay far too little attention. Those are mounds, by the way, that we see all over, all over our county here, were by those first group of Indians we talked about, of which we now sit on that land. So um, I am not for a paid holiday. Uh, therefore, some of the recommendations we're making here go to the fact that we would have that paid holiday. I think that money could be much better spent um, I think if you even told the employees that they could make a decision on how they wanted to spend that money, they might spend it different than that. Right now, we just got input from two, from two groups, I guess, when I guess they were asked. They were formed by us and asked if they wanted to have a paid holiday. No paid holiday, but certainly the rest of it, I'm, I would be supportive of. Um, I just want to clarify, are you saying you're not in support of the in-service day either? Um, in-service day can be handled different ways, and, and we don't have to pay for somebody to do their in-service. Um, no, have, I'm just saying, but, but no, thank you, no, there. thank you, no, thank you for the question. So I work. I'm I'm on a number of organizations here in, in Dunedin. We do a lot of service. I do a lot of service days. I'll do a lot of them on Saturdays. Um, I do a lot of service days. I, I let's not talk about me. I'm in organizations that do a lot of service days. Um, we, we're not getting paid for them. Um, we do them. Okay, so you're not you're not in support of uh, closing Pay. city operations on a Monday or whatever the day is, and I am not. and having an in okay. No. I just wanted to clarify. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for doing it. I'm taking my mask off. I reserve that right so you can see my face when I'm talking on this particular subject. Uh. I think you clarified, Teresa, that this is this has come up because it's a federal holiday now. Okay, so of course other dates wouldn't be considered. I don't even think that's a conversation. If somebody wants to suggest something for some other group, great, bring it forward, as Commissioner Gal mentioned. But that's not the purpose here. It's not for us to debate what the federal government did or why they did it. And I don't want to make a statement that I'm for or against what the federal government did. They did it. So it's for us to decide how we're going to apply it. Um, period. That's it. Um, I'm going to be really careful in how I say this because I don't want to condemn anybody else's opinion. They're allowed to have it. 
they were duly elected to do so. Um, however, the question is, is do we want to celebrate Freedom Day? That's the question. And I say yes, absolutely. It's a different celebration than any other holiday. It's for a different reason. It is um, in our diversity, in our education that we have come to know in the things that have happened a couple in the last couple of years. I think we've learned just how important it is that these things are separate events that have happened in our history and deserve celebration and acknowledgement. Um, so I'm very supportive of that, however we choose to do that. Um, so I don't think any other dates to be considered is a conversation. That's a, not along with this. That's a whole separate conversation. Uh, I think we have to be really careful of the language we use. I, I really do. Um, and I guess that's all I'll say is into response to some of the feedback I've heard up here. I think we have to be really, really important to what we say. And um, I would just encourage everybody to do that. Uh, I'm supportive of what the city manager wants to do. I'm, really, it's, I know it's a budgetary impact in a way that is not necessarily uh, a paid holiday, would, a straight paid holiday would be, um, which is really the only reason, you know, we're even here talking about this. Otherwise, you'd be able to do what you want to do. Um, I'm fine with having that holiday closed to the public, which is really my only conversation here. I think it's fine. It makes a great statement. I think what you want to do with the employees, I think the morale, I think diversity training, that's why we created United. Um, you know, at some point it'll go a step further, but this is exactly the thing we wanted United for. We saw a lot of things happening out in the community with George Floyd, and I won't give the list of names, but that's, you know, all of that going on. And, and, community unrest all over our country. And we said we wanted to take an active role and say, how can we be better, even if they're small steps? This is absolutely a small step to be better. Multiple ways of having the same conversations. And I'm very supportive of that. I think it's a reasonable approach. And as you do it, you'll find ways to make it even better. So go do you. Thank you for following our initial um, guidance, which was create United and help us figure out how to do things better. And I think that's exactly what you've done. And I appreciate that. So I'm very supportive of what you've proposed. And I thank you for doing that. And again, want to remind everybody to, um, you know, it's a separate celebration. It doesn't make it more important or less important than any other day we commemorate. But there's a particular reason for it, and it's incumbent upon us to understand it, especially when it's a federal ho holiday. And these things will help us understand it. So. Thank you, Mayor. If I may nail down that consensus direction. The, uh, uh, the. Item one, which is. The, uh, major the majority of the consensus direction. Okay, right. is the um, in-service day? Yes, and the things that you want to do with that, and and um, the uh, number one <clears throat> proclamation, the proclamation, the displays, oh, yeah. anything that is not um, you know shut down a street. Right. So Let's number one, way. Mayor three F, which is encourage displays in library DFAC, and number four, which is the in-service day. Yeah, it doesn't mean there aren't other things you can do. It's we're just saying right. don't shut down the street for something yet. Right. Let's let's build it. You know? Right. Let's build things. And we may have 
as because this is a brand new holiday in theory. I mean, in in a time of our country, right? So there may be things that come along that other people do that says, "Oh my God, that's so Dunedin. Let's do it." I don't want to make it like, let's start with things and move on. All right. You good? I am good. Thank you, Mayor, for your support for the in service day. We're going to make it a very good day. And I, I kind of like Commissioner's idea, uh, Vice Mayor's idea. Um, maybe it's not the employee picnic, but we can certainly come and join you guys for lunch. Yes. You know, or help with in service, or <laughs> if they want us to join them for lunch. <laughs> no, I know that. I'm sure always. they always want us. I know that. They want to get away from us. <laughs> I know that. I, I get it. But I, I'm just saying, you know, I'm, whatever. If you don't want us. We're okay with that too. Keep your I'd like right to make to a not comment, invite. by the way. A federal holiday is President's Day. We don't we don't honor it. Well, but for clarification of what you said. Thank you. Maybe we should. Well, if I may Again, I'll... I don't want to debate. No, it's not debate. Uh, the you know if there's another date that we should honor more. Because I gotta tell you, if you go down that road, you got a problem with me. That's not the purpose I'm of this. I'm just correcting discussion. what you said. You You're said not if correcting it's a federal what I said. Holiday, I'm saying it's a federal holiday, we should do it. I said it's a federal holiday, we should consider it. Nobody's brought forward, should we consider another federal holiday? I don't want to compare this. When you start comparing this to something else, you're now saying that this isn't worthy. And that's not a message that I want to send out to this community. That's incorrect. That's not saying that at all. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. Because that's the way it's being perceived. Trust me when I say that. We need to be careful with the words we use and how we voice things. That's the whole purpose of this, is to start a dialogue to learn how to speak differently and think differently. So it is exactly what this is about. Okay, uh, it's time for a quick break and then we have our dream plan. Yay, let's take five minutes.
call the meeting back to order. Commissioner Franey has a question that she wants to ask. I do. Um, you know, I, the, the mass while we're meeting. I just want I mean, we went through all of the pandemic once we did the plexiglass. You know, we're separated. We're separated from anybody out there. Um, and we didn't wear masks when we were up here once we got seated. Um, you know, unless somebody obviously knows they've been exposed, which I think that's different. Um, I just would, I'm not sure I understand the reasoning that we have to, and it's easier not to. And um, so if there's no scientific reason to do it up here, since we put this up here for that reason, mm -hmm. and we went through the pandemic and didn't do it, I just, I, and, and I know there were some reasons that we came back with masks and, and we're being super cautious. I'm not sure that reason still exists, but I just want to, if we don't, if this takes care of our scientific cure, it's just easier not to have the mask while we're kind of articulating our discussion. So I just asked that. I want to do everything that's appropriate and proper. Um, so I, I did give uh, Jennifer a heads up that I was going to bring this up and just getting your opinion, Jennifer. So, so we, um, I would say, strongly encouraged, or we actually require the mass of city employees. And we require the mass of city employees when they are in a common workplace when they can't socially distance. Um, at the beginning, the last two sets of meetings, as you, as you recall, the beginning of January, Omicron was still relatively new at that point. There had been exposures and we had just implemented the mask mandate. That said, I do think that the plexiglass offers enough protection in my mind. Uh, we're not socially distanced, but we do have a divider between all of us. And, um, and we are, to my knowledge, all vaccinated and boosted. So, you know, it's, I think it's a personal choice. It really was, to, to, as an example of the employees, to wear the masks, but they don't have the plexiglass and that type of a thing. So I think it, I think it really is up to the commission. It is extremely difficult to talk when you're in the mask. Yeah. Now, if I can just say, um, while I certainly respect your opinion, um, I think what we ask our employees to do, we do also. That's how I feel. It's almost a solidarity. If we're asking other people to do it, I think we should do it. But, you know, I'm not, I can only speak for myself. Yeah, I guess my only comment is I'm not sure this is exactly the situation we require of our, our employees. If it is, I'm happy with that, but I don't think scientifically, you know, it, but it's fine. I mean, I, I'll go with what the commission feels. Um, you know, my understanding is if you can't socially distance, so if I'm literally out there sitting with everybody, then I better mask up and I would mask up and that's what we're asking our employees. But We've put extra measures up here to take care of our science, but I'll do it. I'll, I'm not the will of the commission. I'm not trying to be difficult. I just think it is difficult sometimes to articulate. Well, I think, like, for instance, a little while ago when I wanted to speak, I, I did take my mask off because it was something I was passionate about and I wanted my face to be seen. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think if we're just sitting here, you can leave your mask on. I think if you're talking and, and, and trying to not just chatting like we are right now, but you're sure. trying to convey a, a point or you're giving your final comments on something that's important to you, you want to take your mask off, go right ahead. Mm -hmm. You know, because I do think you're correct. We do have this. Um, and, I, and I also think, you know, we've been with an abundance of caution because Omicron is so much more contagious. I mean, so much more contagious. Um, but I, I do think, you know, we're pretty well protected and I think y'all make your own choices that you want to do. I don't think we have to Oh, look at you with your lights. I just noticed that. Everybody's got their lights. Where are ours? I want some. I do think, um, Mayor, yes. if I, I think it's okay if staff takes off the mask too for the presentation because it is difficult for now. Yeah, I mean, There's again, no one around I her. think if right. we are taking precautions, you don't have somebody sitting next to you, you're not, right. you know There's what I'm no saying? no one around her and it's difficult. Yeah, I, I think, but we just have to be really cognizant of, you know, just like we didn't come down like we traditionally would for the firefighter presentation today. Mm -hmm. That was on purpose because we just didn't need a group of people down there. Right. You know, um, so I think if we continue to do those things and you don't yeah, want to. When I talk, I'll probably yeah. take my mask off yeah. and I'll leave it on all the rest of the time. Thank okay. you for the consideration. Sure. Um, all right. So, Na um, Natalie, who do we. What do we have for presentation perspective? It's you and I'm sure somebody else or just you? I have quite a few people here. Um, to so we're going to kind of do it individually questions. or whatever so that to, for space purposes? 
I'm just planning to go through the whole thing and then questions that may arise that would better fall for one person, um, they should be here to help support those answers. Okay, and how are you gonna go through this? Because I, I know we'll probably have a lot of questions. I mean, it's one of those things, and as we should. And I wanna try to get, you know, trying to determine whether um, you're gonna, it's better to do your whole presentation and then do questions, or is it better to take it in chunks? So should we just follow, are you gonna do this in sections? It's really up to commission. Um, I can do either way, whatever is best. We have 10 focus areas to get through. Okay, so, so maybe we do it by focus area. Does that make sense to you all? Does that seem reasonable? Because I'm sure there were certain people that were on certain focus areas too. I will say the, the only thing is that with having so many focus areas, you'll probably think of something when we're talking about one topic and it's like we haven't gotten there yet. Well, you tell us that. So I don't know if you want to hear kind of the full story, and then we can go back, or if you want to I'm do going to suggest we do it by focus area, just knowing past history when we try to take on something, you know, this big. Okay. And so for those purposes, if, if the commission is, is getting ahead of ourselves, then Natalie yeah, will say it. Yeah, just say it, and that's okay. You're not going to hurt our feelings. Not that you ever do that. Really. But, <laughs> not that you never, ever do that. Never we, we got tough skin. We've else. got tough skin, and, and let's just, you know, obviously we'll all do our best to stick to what we see, and if we don't see something, let's just make a note of it, and then we don't see it by the end, and then we bring it up. Sounds good. Okay? Great. Um, and also, when you, you know, if you did have somebody that focused on that area, certainly call them out. And then at the end, I'm sure we would love to hear from the Committee on Environmental Quality and Sustainability. Um, you know, just because let's face it, as we all know, these people, these folks and great representatives in our community put a whole ton of work into this. This wasn't just you know, they physically helped write it. So, you know, I, I want them to have a voice and I want the community to know that because this is really a community-driven document. So, go, you're on. Thank you, well, good morning, Mayor. Good morning. Vice Mayor, <clears throat> Commissioner, City Manager, and everyone we have here today, I appreciate you all coming out. I think we're gonna have a lot of fun today going through this document. I want my green lights too, by the way, even if it's tomorrow or the next day or next week, somebody get me some green lights. Sounds good. Me too. <laughs> my name is Natalie Gass and I'm the sustainability program coordinator for the city and really beyond excited to bring this document forward. This is Dunedin's Resilient Environmental Action Master Plan, DREAM. And it is the city's first sustainability master plan and really a 10 year look forward for where we wanna go with our goals, our initiatives and our plans. Dunedin is such a vibrant and special community that's something we certainly wanna uphold and expand upon. And so DREAM is really all about answering the question, how does Dunedin become a more sustainable, equitable, smart and efficient city? So that's what we'll be talking about today. The full document is comprised of three parts. Really, we're gonna be going over parts one and two today. Um, we'll be going through the introduction and background behind how DREAM was developed, as well as those focus areas, and we'll break them down once we get there. And after that, we'll go through next steps, as well as what DREAM 15 is all about. To start us off, I wanted to go over a few key terms that make this document really what it is. First is sustainability, and that term has been used in various forms, but for environmental sustainability, the purpose here is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the needs of future generations to meet their own needs. And sustainability is really interwoven with the idea of resiliency Resilience is the ability to bounce back in a proactive manner. And I think a lot of times when we hear bouncing back, we might think about going back to the same spot or the same practice, but really resiliency is about moving forward so that we can reduce the impact that these hazards may have, whether they're man-made or they are natural hazards. 
And finally, social equity and environmental justice is all about the fair treatment and inclusion of all people and communities, regardless of race, gender, national origin, income level, in the development and implementation of these environmental programs, policies, and laws. Now, sustainability, since this is what it's, it's all about, I wanted to just take a brief moment and kind of demonstrate the concept and the importance through a few different models. A really common model to show sustainability is called the triple bottom line, which you see here on the screen. And it can also be called the three P's principle. That's people, planet, profit. And so this model states that sustainability can be found at the intersection of these three components or realms. And it does you know, provide information that there are different components to sustainability, but it really fails to provide a realistic approach to what's actually happening. So the three components or realms are kind of shown in the same size, maybe alluding to the same value or importance. And they're shown as different entities, maybe implying that they could be standing alone. A much more realistic approach to understanding sustainability is the nested dependencies model. Fancy term, it really just means that we're dependent on the environment. Ultimately, our economy does not exist outside of our society, and neither of those exist outside of our earth and our environment. Good exercise for this is to think about, think about a career, uh, a business, something that you do in your everyday life. Everything that we do comes from natural resources. Doesn't matter what product you sell, doesn't matter what services you offer, doesn't matter what projects or construction or ideas that you have, it all starts with natural resources. It all starts with the earth. So when we protect and improve our natural environment, we are certainly protecting and improving the other realms that are dependent on that, our society and our economic realms. And I just want to really make it so clear that instead of thinking about sustainability as maybe a nice to have or a component where we intersect at some place, really it is the foundation that everything else builds upon. So we have a few models and some terms behind us. I wanted to go through a little bit of the, the organization and how DREAM was developed as a plan. It began as a staff-led initiative, understanding that sustainability in Dunedin has been happening for decades, but it was really now time for an organized document to help lead us into the next 10 years. Very specific pathway forward that really interlined with the community's needs and scientific needs. Once we had that going, community writing teams were developed, which we had members of our Committee on Environmental Quality, which was, uh, it's now CEQs, but at the time it was CEQ. We also had members that were residents, business owners, local experts, people from schools in our area. And so really it was a great project where they provided a lot of information about the organizational structure, the action items, as well as the research behind all of these action items. So I greatly appreciate all of their time. And we have quite a few people here today who have been a part of that process. At that same time, staff worked with UF IFAS Extension to develop community listening sessions, community forums, and a survey to really further engage that community voice. And we also had community input through various platforms, including social media, phone calls, emails. So you can see a lot of the community's voice is really a part of this document. It is a Dunedin document. Um, and finally, we actually had a school, Our Lady of Lords Catholic School, their middle school science students, this was a project of theirs, and they turned in PowerPoint presentations of what they want to see, what they want Dunedin to be in the future. They are the next generation, and to have their voice a part of this was really impactful, so I appreciate uh, the teacher in the school making that a priority. All of that can be found within the full methodology report. It is on the DREAM page on our city website. If you're looking for a really interesting read with tables and graphics and you want to grab a hot cup of tea and read through that, I think, I think you'll enjoy it. But really it goes through 
how this document was created. And I think it's a, a beautiful demonstration of what our community it values and really wants to see. So the methodology report also goes into what the community values, what the community wants to see prioritized, and how they want to be interacted with on sustainability efforts and actions. And we'll kind of dive into that. But this is going to be very helpful for the implementation phase of this project. Before I go any further, I just want to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone that's been involved, everyone who's spent hours and days and months writing, who have spent time in our community listening sessions or providing comment, for those who have provided resources and information and scientific data, and just for everyone who's been here together, our staff, and it's, it's really been wonderful. And being able to work with other cities in our area has also been um, wonderful, a great resource to have their support as well. So DREAM is really organized in four main categories, outlined as EPIC, playing off the terms of what we like to use here in the city, our EPIC goals, and knowing that this is an EPIC DREAM. So E stands for environmental quality, P stands for people and processes, I for infrastructure and smart development, and C for consumption and conservation. We've also used the city's colors to help organize the document and help readers to understand where they are and what sections they're reading about. When you take these four main categories and line them vertically uh, down the side, you'll see that they expand into those 10 focus areas, which is going to be the majority of what we'll talk about today. These are all different topic areas that really dive into those action items. Each one of the 10 focus areas has a specific goal, which we'll talk about. And each one of the 10 focus areas is organized in a way that goes through a few different sections. We start with those progress highlights. That's a one pager talking about what we've been doing up until this point. We can't highlight absolutely everything that we've done as a city, um, which is a really good thing to say, but we wanted to kind of keep it concise to a one pager, and so that provides a little insight of what's been happening so far. We then go into new strategies, which really highlights the action items and categorizes them either as city operations, community collaboration, or the citizen engagement piece. City operations are things that we will be doing uh, as a city, and that may impact just our internal <coughs> operations, but it can also impact our community. Community collaboration <coughs> is about working with outside partners and organizations to really be able to do those action items. And then finally, the citizen engagement piece is all about what individuals can do on their own, whether they're at home or their workplace or their lifestyle. And it really shows that there's so many different levels of taking action on sustainability. Finally, there's a small section on future ideas to explore. This can be one or multiple ideas that we might not be committing to yet, but something certainly to continue to move us forward. Um, it may be a good concept or idea or case study. When you take this organizational structure and apply it to a focus area, you get this nice breakout of pages with lots of information as well as links to either the city's web pages or other outside organizations and it really has a deep dive into all of that information. We won't be going over all these pages today, we'll be mainly focusing on the highlights. All of the action items again are trying to answer that question. How does Dunedin become a more sustainable, equitable, smart and efficient city? All of the action items are potential and feasible recommendations for the city to take, and they leave flexibility for our city operations. They empower the community's voice as they were written and developed through listening sessions, surveys, and writing teams. They are in alignment with local, regional, and global efforts for science-based solutions. And they also incorporate goals and perspectives from a lot of our other documents. So DREAM is not meant to stand alone. It's meant to interact and communicate with our comprehensive plan, our stormwater master plan, our 
um, multimodal transportation master plan, our parks plans, and then the USF studies that were done a few years ago. So there's a lot of interconnection between all of this, and I think it really shows how the entire city is moving forward in this direction. So DREAM is a 10-year vision, a 10-year outlook with 50 action items in each section, which would mean five per year, and we'll dive into that uh, when we get into the next steps. But uh, now is kind of our time where we'll be going into those 10 focus areas. Okay. Um, if you want me to, you want to start? It, hang on one second. Yeah. I just want to... On the methodology, does anybody have any questions or comments, whatever, on the methodology part of it? <clears throat> My only question was is uh, when you showed us the list of contributors and people that were a part of it, I didn't see the Sierra Club. Did, w did they review this and give their feedback at all? Sierra Club has reviewed our Ready for 100 pathway, which is a part of this. Okay. Um, that's the only piece then. Yeah, and that's kind of a, a subset of what, you'll what is about. within DREAM, mm -hmm. um, but just the, the full process of creating and writing it. Um, okay. They mainly focused on a review of the Ready for 100 pathway. And that's great. I just know that they also, they also, I mean, they always recommend on top of Ready for 100, which, you know, we signed on even when it was the mayor's Ready for 100 in 2017, they also recommend each city have an environmental master plan, and that's essentially what this is for us. So I was just, I was just curious if you, and if, if they didn't feel the need, then that's fine. But I, in the future, it might, yeah, might be great to have them review and give any input as to if they they think because they've offered many many times to help us with certain things. And um, you know implementation of certain things, but it it would be helpful to know what they thought about what we've got on paper, where they could tell us: Are there any of these things that you can, whether it's physical, <coughs> physically going out and helping us, or resources or whatever? So that that was it. We can go back to it later. Though. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. <clears throat> okay, so we'll go back to the. Uh, did you have something, Joe? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know whether to bring it up here or not, but I do have a question about just the overall goals and actually the verbiage of the goals. I don't know whether it's the time to bring that up now. That's it, probably as we go through each one, or? Uh, yeah, well, we can bring it up now, I guess, because using land as an example. It just, the city aims to expand, and before I get started, wonderful, wonderful product. Thank you very much. And I, and I don't want to get too picky, but <clears throat> when, when I read over it and I saw the word AIMS, and that seems to be the, the focus of, of all the goals, it, it seemed like, eh, well, AIM, well, if we make it, we make it. If we don't, we don't. Affordable housing, oh, that project failed. Yeah, well, maybe next time. You, you know, the, it, it didn't have enough teeth. It didn't say this is our plan to me, and, but I don't want to wordsmith this, uh, you know, because I, when I read this whole document, I went from, oh, I can change a whole bunch of it to, no, it's a nice piece of work, don't mess with it, let it flow. So emotionally, I am all over the place with this, to, just to be honest, um, but I just want to know if, if you, why AIM was chosen, why it, wasn't worded a little more strongly, a little more teeth, a little more planning a flag type of approach on where the city wanted to go as far as its goals. I mean, I think when you, you set a goal, you're aiming to reach that goal. It's a term that you use. It's nothing to state that we don't have teeth or we're not intending to reach those goals. Um, I don't think that, you know, I'm happy to change any of the verbiage um, if you feel that's what it's portraying, but I don't think that was ever a part of it. We were trying to, you know, loosen the reins. So if it feels that way, we can certainly look at changing the, the verbiage. So maybe uh, as we go through, I mean, again, yeah, you're right. We're not going to wordsmith this. However, I understand your point. Your point is, is you want strong, bold language is what you're saying, mm -hmm. in essence. So 
let's get through all the different focus areas and we'll read each one of those, right? And then at the end, after we've heard everything, then maybe there's a collective message we can send that y'all will take a look at and discuss amongst yourselves. Does that sound all right? Sure. All right. Mayor, for the record, I just, I just want to state that we really haven't given up on affordable housing. It's still in the budget. We're still really working hard to bring that project I, forward. I wasn't implying and she, that. Yeah, no. And, and, and I know that, my but apologies I just don't want anybody for any, in, on, on implying that right. on my part. That's okay. not, I, just, not. I just don't want anybody to think we, we've given up on that. Oh, I well, and, we and I, I do understand what uh, Commissioner Gallo's point is because it, even though maybe that wasn't your attention, we know from experience that sometimes it can become a political thing. Right. Kind of like our discussion about rules and regs for boards and committees, you know, should versus shall, and, and how those things get played with. We see it in many different things. So I totally understand why you're saying what you're saying. Um, but then I bet you that our city manager will come back and say, well, you, you gotta give us some flexibility. So anyway, so let's just keep all that in mind. I didn't want to distract you, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first section, first Wonderful. focus area. Thank you. So the first focus area in our environmental quality section is land. The goal here is to expand and improve our green spaces, our parks, our landscapes, and our terrestrial ecosystems. For city operations, that looks to really increase our sustainability that we have within our, our landscaping and our operations section, as well as, the, as well as looking to preserve space and expand those parks in service area gaps, um, and to create those partnerships with outside organizations that can continue to help um, in those efforts. For community collaboration, that looks to expand and continue to evaluate the uh, urban forest and our tree canopy here in Dunedin, as well as creating wildlife corridors and expanding our services in that way through more education for our community. And for the citizen engagement piece is looking to encourage residents to certify their yard uh, as sustainable, whether that's there's a number of different organizations that we can partner with to do that. Um, looking to really promote those native plants over um, other items that may be harmful to the environment and looking to do uh, light pollution reduction and more cleanups. That's kind of a simple overview. If you want to dive into a specific item, let me know. Any questions or comments on the land section? <clears throat> Commissioner? Yeah, I had a couple. Um, so the sustainable landscaping for city property, I'm assuming parks and Craig have been involved and that's all doable, manageable, and makes sense. Cool, great, so that was number one. Um, the, the green space setbacks, um, so this is talked about multiple times within the document, so I'll just hit the question here. And it's interesting because I think in different ways it talks about setbacks versus height, vertical growth versus saving green space. I mean, how much discussion did you guys get into, or is it just the, the environmental, um, the best green principle for us is if you have to pick between the green space and height, you pick, you pick the height. I think it's really, you know, with any any action item that you take, there's pros and cons. So I think you don't ever get a perfect solution. Um, but I don't think that should scare us away from taking action in, in certain things. So that's a very touchy topic, and I think it really depends on where you are in the city. Um, certainly if you know, you're closer to those, those major mass transportation areas, um, you want to make sure that any development is very intentional. And so I don't want to just say, yep, let's do vertical growth everywhere because that's the best thing ever. Um, it's, it's really about the intention and having an overall plan that makes sense, not just, so I can't really say one or the other. It, it has to fit for the project and the overall goals. I mean, some of my colleagues will remember one time you know, we got a lot of flack when we did some setback changes and people were like, oh, you're leaving us like no space to build. 
because you've pushed the snapbacks. But it, it's just interesting because it really does kind of uh, get everybody thinking about the trade-off. Um, and I, your answer is great because you're right; it's very, very sensitive. But it is a trade-off, and 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 it, you know, it's just going to always be an ongoing debate. So, thank you, Natalie. That, those were my two main questions. Any other questions on the land? I do. Uh -huh. um, or you comments know, too. Comments too. I have always been fascinated with the wildlife corridors and how those work. Um, do you uh, put a conservation easement on a particular area where, say, the gopher, tortoise, or uh, you know, you have a specified habitat? How, how do you do that? I mean, I was looking at particularly in the Everglades. You know, when you're trying to go, they they had these animals that they were losing going over that main road. What is it? Um, Alligator Alley. Alligator Alley. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I always wondered how you created, with the impediment of that many motorists, a, a wildlife corridor. I mean, I I've just thought and thought about that. So I would just appreciate if you could you know, give me a little more information so I can better understand it. Absolutely. So wildlife corridors um, have kind of mainly been viewed as those overpasses that you'll mm -hmm. see, and they have webcams of the bears roaming around there, which yeah. is really fun and cool. Um, but I think it's, it's so much more than just thinking about an overpass of a road. It's when you think about hab habitat fragmentation, good example is our, our golf carters, right? A lot of us like to see we have a golf cart, we want to get around town, and, and when you are like, I want to get to that side of town, and it's really difficult because you don't have a straightforward path, it's kind of the same concept for wildlife. Because there's so much development and you, you lose that habitat, you're not making these connected areas for them to move, to find food, shelter, um, and go along their way. So an innovative way to think about wildlife corridors is you think about everyone's front yards. And that can be a corridor to connect wildlife from parks to parks, green spaces to preservation areas. And it, it not only beautifies your own yard, um, it, it helps with our wildlife species. And so getting neighborhoods more in a community effort to engage together to create these pathways is kind of the direction that um, I think we had for that goal. But it's not a, a physical, it doesn't have to be a physical delineation of this corridor. That's what I, I mean, looking at the Everglades, I, you don't, it's not like you have something fenced off, I mean, no. It's no, I mean, because we have wildlife that goes through our front yards anyways. Mm -hmm. And so trying to connect that a little bit more through native species and just improvements that will help is the goal. It's not really fencing off anything. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just in trying to encourage, I guess, <sighs> routes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Commissioner? When it comes to... What we, do, what we are allowed to do in our yards. Do you anticipate having to make any code changes to allow that? Uh, right now, if your grass grows over 10 inches, right, you can, you can be fined for that. So, I, and I, I'm not up on the code in that section. So if we want food for us and things of that nature, or front yard gardens, is all that allowed? Or do we need to make changes to code for that? I think we certainly need to review code and make sure that it's aligning with the direction that the city wants to take in terms of sustainability um, and have those greater discussions of what is what is a good front yard? Is it, you know, is it just grass? Is it, do you incorporate native plants and do you consider those grasses? Do you consider, I think it's, it's a bigger discussion and a review process that would need to take place. Um, and then we can, you know, analyze if codes need to be changed, and if so, um, if that was the direction of the commission, then I think that's what we move forward with. But I think there's a much bigger discussion around that. Okay. And it, I don't know if it's specifically mentioned here, but it's several times throughout, is 50% native plants. And as I talked about, 
I thought maybe aiming was a little too um, passive. We were pretty adamant about 50%, 50% need. And um, I'm just curious as to that percentage. Why isn't it 100% native plants? Why? Craig's here to help. Ah, <laughs> our friend Craig. So the, the reason why we landed on that figure is, A, it's already in our code for any new development. And I don't know that we're currently meeting our own code. So I figured at the very least we would establish a, you know, establish that we can meet our, our code and then maybe in the, in the, you know, the goals to come in years in the future, we increase it at that point, but I at least wanted to get us to that minimum baseline. Um, and there is actually some, some increases, like as far as right now, the code says palms only have 25% have to be native. We're now saying 50. Um, ground covers, vines, 0% have to be native. We're now saying 50. So um, the thing that's staying the same, so to speak, but we're just trying to get city forces and staff to plant more native would be the trees and shrubs, we're trying to focus more on that and, and, and at least getting that done and then also incorporating some of those other ground covers and vines as well. Um, but we're also focusing on species diversity too, so not just we're planting 100% magnolias through the downtown core. I mean, that's not what we're doing, but we're making sure we're planting multiple different species, species so we have diversity. Um, and if they wanted to deviate from that, they would have to get written permission from management. Um, so it would have to be justified. Maybe it just didn't work in a certain area or whatever the case may be, but it established the baseline and um, we could always increase it once we hit that mark. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else for on the land? You know, can I, I'm sorry, because sure. I, I thought I, I missed, you know, the bottom group and I was, we're also talking about the reduced light pollution thing too. Yeah, because I, I did have a question about that. Um, so, um, you know, the new LED lights that shine, you know, on all the streets, I mean, they're bright, right? So we've had complaints about that. So how does that affect the animals? When you think about all the, the bugs that start swirling and spinning around, um, you think about how species have been evolving over all of time uh, to use the stars and the moon to navigate, to find food, to find shelter. So then you introduce all of the artificial light in such a short period of Earth's history, and it's a lot for species to... Um, to grasp. And so you, you find that a lot of light pollution will really negatively impact um, not only your nocturnal species, but also a lot of species that are interconnected within your ecosystem. You think about there's nighttime pollinators. There's a lot that's happening at night when we're sleeping uh, that keeps systems going. And Craig, I mean, you can speak to trees even need darkness um, to, you know, promote their health and I think we all do. We all, you know, I think we're so accustomed to so much light and, and trying to reduce that. Um, I know there's, you know, safety <clears throat> concerns when you start talking about light pollution, but, you know, you can think about um, switching to motion sensors, switching to trying to cover a little bit of that light and direct it to where it needs to go instead of just open light source, especially for migrating birds. And so, um, there's a lot of impacts that we don't think about, and really, when you you shield and you direct light, it becomes much more safe uh, than just having this bright light. I mean, you think about when you're driving in the morning, and the sun's coming in your car, I'm and you want to put you your yeah. your shield down on your car so that you can kind of direct that light and make it useful for yourself. Um, I think that's maybe the biggest concern is the safety aspect, but that can certainly be addressed. Well, I mean, it's interesting because it's another area where we have conflicting issues that go on in the city. And so brighter lights, great for energy conservation, worse for the animals. I mean, you know, I guess during the holidays, are animals completely terrorized with all the holiday <laughs> I know. decoration? You know, I mean, yeah. it does make you think. It does. It does. And I think you can try to start finding some balance in yeah. that. Um, you know, more energy conservation is that the lights are out not that they're brighter and going. Um, so if they're on a motion sensor or if we have an idea where 
you know, it would be great to encourage lights out by this time. You know, we, we still enjoy the holiday lights, but do they need to be on at four right. in the morning? Who's walking around and enjoying them? You know, just, just different ideas and discussion. Yeah, it, it really does make you think. The only other thing I was going to add about the certifying your yard with Native, I, I think because it would be yards with different colors, that's how the report talks about it, but, you know, kind of having pictures and making people understand what that might look like for their whole neighborhood to go that way, those kinds of things would help people get adjusted. So I know that's a deeper dive, but... Yeah, I think it would be wonderful to do something like a tour of gardens, kind of like they do a tour mm -hmm. of the houses, right. and show how beautiful um, mm -hmm. and engaging that these landscapes can be. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I do, if I may, may elaborate on, on Natalie's comment that it's a balance because, as you recall, the multimodal master plan articulates additional lighting, mm -hmm. street lighting. So we got to figure out what that, strike that balance as best we can. Yeah, and I mean, well, I, there's something in the back of my head, but I'm not, I'm going to leave it in the back of my head right now, but it does make you think, you know, very seriously about the different trends and crazes that people have, and, you know, hey, is, is that really a good balance? So thank you. Well, and this is on my list as well to bring up because, you know, as the as Duke Energy is converting the regular light bulbs to the LEDs, we've gotten neighborhood complaints about their brightness. Um, now, we also know during our citizen survey, there are some areas that maybe don't have enough street lights. You know, they weren't developed that way. It really wasn't about brightness as much as they... You know, it's, it's an older neighborhood and they don't have what they feel like they need or, or whatever, um, which we had a program that we were working on and then that kind of went to the wayside when COVID hit because we wanted to cut all our spending. Mm -hmm. So we absolutely have to get back to that because that's what citizens ask for. But, you know, the, but the brightness, I, I would like to understand about the brightness of our streetlights. Streetlights are... A safety issue. We're not going to give that up for our, our residents and you know, neighborhoods. I mean, and they automatically go off and, and all of that. But this brightness issue, I mean, we've, we've been asked to help reduce that. And we've not gone down that road yet. But it does seem sort of conflicting. Yeah. I was going to say uh, public services, I believe, receives some questions about that from time to time. And I know yep. that they'll, they'll request putting in a, like a two inch shield. Right. And it seems to circumvent some, most of it. Yeah, but we're not doing it. The resident is doing it. Yeah, I gotcha. But I'm, but it's, it's I'm just asking, should we be, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, I understand why we took the position we did, yeah. but this is in a different caveat. So I would, I would certainly like to understand that discussion a little bit more than you know what I'm talking about, the shields mm -hmm. and, the, yep. you know, is that something that should be done? And I'm not saying, I'm not quantifying that. I'm just saying, should the shields be there mm -hmm. if all things being equal? I'm not saying we should pay for it. I'm not saying any of that thing. I'm just saying, should the shields be there? Should we be demanding the Duke put it there? Because there are, you know light studies out there that say they should be there. Mm -hmm. That's what I would like to know further information. Not, not, I'm not asking to do anything. I'm just, so that's one thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, land, <clears throat> st sticking with land, when you talk about the chemical use. Let's face it, we all know that there's a huge discussion about Roundup out there. We, we, we have not taken a formal position because we worked with the county. The county was looking at um, <clears throat> trying to find alternatives to that. And we wanted to do the same as the county did, mm -hmm. right? We wanted to be a part of that. Um, and they've not made public statements on it either. We know they've reduced things, mm -hmm. but I mean, so I would like to have more information on that. I know you probably can't respond to it right right now, but... Mayor, uh, I'll work with staff, because the integrated uh, vegetation management, the county did adopt that, that resolution, and the cities were on board in terms of what chemicals that you could use or should use. They were all recommendations. And I know that our Parks and Recreation Department is working uh, with the county, and, and really, 
kind of, we are doing the same best practices as the county as well. So we have addressed that and, and we, we can bring back a report. Well, but I, because, I mean, there are a number of environmentally conscious people in this community that obviously think we should be banning it, as a number of communities have, because of all the lawsuits and the, mm -hmm. cancer, the fear of cancer and all of those things. So I don't want to shy away from it. If we're, if we're going to use it under cir certain circumstances, we need to be able to defend that. And I want to be very educated in defending, you know, being able to defend it. And if we can't defend it, then we shouldn't be doing it. I, and I'm, again, I'm not passing judgment on it at this point. I understand when you're doing something in such a large capacity, you know, we have so much city property and that kind of thing. I understand that it, it, it's a different situation than an individual in their own yard. And what are the alternatives? You know, I've been told bring goats in. I'm like, well, that's unrealistic in an urban environment, you know. So I, I just want to have more information on that. And then, um, you know, it talked about the membership to keep Pinellas beautiful, which love it, love it, love it. Are there other organizations that you looked at that we should be joining to try to partake of benefits of what they're doing? Um, I think the Native Plant Society is a wonderful organization, especially our, our Florida chapters and I, the Pinellas chapter as well. Um, they can definitely help provide a lot of resources, information, in that engagement piece. Um, I am not sure if they have a membership, so I can do some more research on that. <coughs> well, I'd like to understand, we're, and you, and we're you might be- currently members with them. Oh. Okay, and you may, you may have it written throughout this, but you know, like, first thing I thought of was the Sierra Club, again, for resource purposes. You know, I'd like to know all of the organizations that we might consider, you know being members of. So those are just some future information things I'd like to know. Thank you. Sounds good. Anything else on land? Okay. Moving over to, and I just wanted to kind of show this. So all of these action items are then expanded upon within that uh, part three of the document, um, which have all the information and resources and links as well. So the next section is water with the goal to improve the quality of aquatic ecosystems. And for city operations, that means to continue the, the ecosystems around aquatic spaces that we do um, own and maintain, looking at our water quality testing and our partnership with Pinellas County on the water quality testing, as well as um, really heavily relying on our stormwater master plan that was developed and presented so there's a lot of recommendations and ideas through that. For community collaboration that looks at doing projects around habitat restoration um, and maybe some spaces that aren't owned by the city but ways that we can get more involved through you know, cleanups and different certifications working with um, our, our beaches and everything like that. And the citizen engagement side is learning how to fertilize appropriately, um, really understanding that stormwater component. It's a, it's a big touch point I think residents can understand, um, as well as you know plastic reduction and looking to do more cleanups as well. Okay, questions or comments on water? I have some. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, you know, um, I guess I'll go to page 40, only rain down the drain. Obviously, I understand it. I mean, I'm fully familiar with it, um, with the grass clipping, leaves, litter, et cetera, all going down the drain. Um, but when you put in pool in installations and brick paver installations, tell me about that. Is that just the concern that as they're putting them in, that stuff tends to get washed off and goes down the drain? you know in any kind of construction project okay. um, where you're not really trying to filter that you can get those contaminants going so it's not the after they're in it's, it's while they're really being put the, in yeah the process so let me ask you this question because in my neighborhood i walk a lot and i've seen a couple houses where they're kind of going from a lot less grass and more pavers in the, like almost like this huge turnaround paver and then there's almost no front yard what, what what's the view of that? I mean, is that a? I mean, I always think of less grass, less impervious. But do, do the pavers make up for it? Because you can 
water can get in there, or how does that work? Well, I mean, when you think about the the bigger the the tree or the vegetation, the deeper your roots are going to be to help really draw that water down quickly. Um, so grass is the least, you know, they have the, the shortest root systems. And then when you think mm -hmm. of pavers, they don't have any roots. Um, so, I mean, you're going to still, you know, see water filtration, but it's just going to not be at the speed that you would see a tree or other, especially native plants, take down. But maybe Craig has some comments. I would say there are permeable and impermeable pavers. There's two different varieties. Mm -hmm. And even the ones that are permeable can sometimes become locked you know, over a period of time and not be permeable in the future. But I believe within our ordinance, um, there is a, they cannot just paver the whole property. There is a minimum impervious surface ratio mm -hmm. that they have to adhere to. So I, I'm not involved in that, but I know that there is one there. And um, I'm assuming it was established on some sort of baseline. You know. Yeah. So and so the permit would would be the same. Somebody's putting in a new driveway. They've got to get. It a was permit. considered permeable pavers. They wouldn't be factored into the impervious surface surface ratio. So. Yeah, I mean I've seen a couple of situations where people are just going all pavers, and it just it just kind of in my mind thought, you know, is there a rule about that, or it just it seemed a little overreach. So, um, okay. And a lot um, of the base for the pavers is crushed concrete. And in my opinion, when you get it wet, it turns into concrete, so. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you. I think that's all I have. Any other questions or comments on water? No, uh, I had a couple, and again, if it's somewhere else or if it's <clears> in more detail, I'm simply looking at the summary you're presenting. So a couple things I thought about with water, our derelict boat issue, you know, oil, gas, um, sewage, I didn't see any mention. Did I miss it? No. Okay, um, I, th I think we should, again, I'm not gonna tell you how to include it. Mm -hmm. I think something and a goal with that needs to be suggested. Part of our problem currently is the process of their removal um, that we have to follow. And I think we want to try to figure out how we advocate for a different process. Still not the onus on us. Correct. I'm but the onus thought. on someone else. Mm -hmm. But instead of them waiting two years before they get their money first, get it out of the water because it's an environmental issue. And so I think by having something listed in here, it gives us a little bit more ammunition, you know, for the city manager and attorney and whoever else to go advocate for a different system. So that, that's one, I didn't see any mention about reclaim water, you know? That's in our, um, our infrastructure water side. Gotcha, we'll is that later. different page? Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, later? Yep, okay, I'll take that later. off my list here. Sounds good. And then the other thing, in, and it, beach restoration. Now I, I understand that it's not necessarily water quality there, but, um, we have uh, a causeway that gets visited by 300 and, I'm sorry, th over 3 million people every year. And there is no plan of action from Pinellas County as to how to preserve it, what areas should be sort of environmentally sensitive, and what areas should be restored. It, it's no man's land, and then they take a piece of it when somebody complains, right, and does something. So I don't know where the appropriate place for that to be is, but I, I also think that has to be addressed. Again, so that we can go advocate to the county on what we want to see. Yep, these areas are environmentally sensitive, it's been proven, and then these areas are recreational, and you should fully restore them to what they should be. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I think that's part of the community collaboration of working with Pinellas County and other outside partners to develop strategies that would really make sense, especially for the causeway. It's such a unique place. It is. And There's it, so much going it on. Is. So <laughs> I, again, I don't know if that should be here or land or somewhere else, but I'm just putting it out there. Well, 
Um, can I ask, would that fit under living shorelines? Because you've already said that, uh, which I love, Edgewater and Bayshore, but if you could sync better all the different partners, would the causeway be a place you might look at doing a living shoreline? Um, I think you could look at sections. I don't know if the whole thing could be a living shoreline, yeah. but you could consider sections um, as a possibility. Well, and we've also talked about, uh, what is it? There's two different things, green, a green, not a green way, but a green portal, something. We've already asked for that. Scenic and portal? Did we ask No, for that? that's for the Edgewater is scenic, but this is a green, it's a state designation or. Greenway? Greenway I don't remember, but I mean, we've talked about that over and over and asked for it, but we've been waiting for the bridge to be done before we go after it because currently the causeway <clears throat> in the county's budget is in the road budget because it's considered a road right away versus being in recreation. recreation or even having a portion, you know, split up. And so the people that manage your roads are the people that are managing the causeway. And that's, you know, just that whole concept is, tells you, you know, and I'm not trying to tell county how to do it. I, it just needs to be addressed in multiple departments, multiple budgets. Again, so I think if it's here, it gives you all as employees, as residents, as, as us, ways to advocate for certain things. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else on the water section? Mm -mm. Okay. Well, I do have a, I guess I have a, I do have a question just because as you were talking mayor I came with, under this part of the water section at least in in the manual uh, it talks about the hope spot and so it kind of ties to uh, the mayor's comments about the marina and gas and oil and um, anywhere in here is this the right place to talk about the concern over the Gulf and uh, St. Joseph Sound and the hope spot so we have the, the next page really within the water component. We have a highlight on our hope spot right. um, thanks to Bloom Green <clears throat> Connections. And they're here today to kind of, um, you know, they can speak to different efforts that they've been working on. Um, but they developed these pages and have been continuing to engage the community um, and our schools and, and different groups on actions like this. So, yeah, this is certainly the section uh, where the hope spot is highlighted and discussed. Because I know that the, one of the challenges with the Hope Spot or even the Sound is it's, it's not in the city jurisdiction. And, you know, and also, I don't know whether there are like boats would be in here, but that's a problem. But do, do we talk about, because the Sound, while it's not under city purview, it, it is our backyard and it is where we play. Um, any... Are we partnering with the county? Are we partnering with the Coast Guard? Are we partnering with the appropriate partners uh, to make sure that there's a quality to our sound as well? We're protecting it, our seagrasses, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I know, you know, Blue Green Connections, which we are partnering with them, and, and they have created amazing partnerships throughout the entire area and they're continuing to expand those partnerships. Um, and, and a lot of them are revolved around our, our local areas currently and continuing to expand that as they move up and down the coast, the coastline. But you know, if there are specific organizations or partnerships um, that you encourage, that's something, something that should certainly be within the discussion of um, different action items and things that we're taking that, although it's not city property, it's something that we're impacting and something that we're impacted by. But, yeah. Okay. Does it, thank you. Um, can, can I just tag on to, because you mentioned sewage, the dumping of sewage. Mm -hmm. Now that, it directly goes to the quality and purity of the water and the sound and wherever. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned derelict boats, absolutely, mm -hmm. but then there's the other, just the dumping of sewage. <laughs> You know, and uh, um, how do we really affect that? I mean, 
is there enough Coast Guard to, to really be able to monitor that? Uh, or do we need more stations where you can actually come in to dump your sewage if you're going around the water spaces? I, I, don't, I don't know the answers, but if you talk about the dumpage of sewage, I would say it, it's a huge uh, impairment to the water quality in the sound. I'm not familiar with the process of or regulations around um, our boaters and what they have to abide by. Um, so I don't know if we have anything currently or we do. Okay, in our marina, we have a I we have we a have, pump out. We have a pump out. Should mm -hmm. we have more, or and should we work with uh, neighboring communities and cities to also be sure that we're offering them throughout, you know, around the waterways? Certainly part of the discussion, absolutely. Um, you know, as more of a regional and I, I think we did look at that when we decided to do our own pump out, so we probably have that information that you could throw right in okay. that wouldn't be a research, you know. But I also think we have to, we have to look at our own marina and just, you know, f we have to, unfortunately, we need to monitor whether people are actually, you know, especially liveaboards. We need to know that they're actually doing it. I don't, I don't want to uh, presume the best method of doing that. I leave that to you all, but it's a very sensitive subject. It is. And, mm -hmm. But I think we have to tackle it. Yes. If we're going to be serious, I think we have to tackle it. And I think there needs to be something for environmental purposes that shows that people, especially liveaboards, that they are dumping. Properly in the in the properly, right. yeah. Agree, totally agree. That that's that's the role you take as becoming a liveaboard, that you will. But it, I mean, I think all of our boaters that have facilities should be able to show mm -hmm. that that has occurred. But especially the liveaboards. But it only takes one bad actor, and it does. That's pretty, you know. And so especially as our group, so I do think mm -hmm. there should be some mention of that and it should be under our action items. I agree. However you choose to. It can be, again, very broad at this point until you figure it out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move any further, I will make a quick plug for the Hope Spot Festival in February 12th, Edgewater Park. They're putting together an amazing program. Uh, city's going to be a part of, and we are really excited about that coming forward. So a great day of ocean conservation and some innovative uh, sustainability solutions will be shared there. So the, the next category is people and processes. The first focus area here is our community with the goal of creating an inclusive community that is engaged in sustainability. City operations, we're really looking to increase our training and engagement for our staff and increase our knowledge base on sustainability efforts, as well as create some resources and tools for staff to really utilize and being able to assist them in making um, better choices for operations. Community collaboration is looking to create a local task force to continue to spread this information and education with our schools and businesses. And then finally, the citizen engagement piece is about um, bringing community members together and really focusing on neighborhoods and neighborhood action as well. Anybody have comments or questions on this? Piece? Yep. I did. Uh, just uh, the the city of Dunedin app. Um, di didn't we? Didn't somebody start try to start a Dunedin city of Dunedin app chamber? Yes, they're working on that. Were, I uh, mean, the alliance. The alliance. Yeah. The alliance are they, I mean, what? Where's? <clears throat> do we have one? I mean, it's not up and running at this they're point. Working. So they're that's the same on. principle you're talking about. I mean, or yeah, is this was an different? idea brought um, by one of our writing teams to to either coordinate with huh? someone who's already creating an app right. uh, or create our own, whichever pathway is the best and um because I, I love the idea i think it's an awesome it's a great idea i think yeah. we should be doing it so provide resources for our community and information about parks and resources right. great okay that's my only comment really 
Any comment or other questions on community? I did, um, and and you're almost saying the same thing I'm going to say. I'm just sort of condensing it so, and it and it may be appropriate for some other place because in each section you're you're mentioning, um, you know, engagement with the community on, you know, energy audits, yard audits, blah blah blah. And so I just, again, we don't have to get into detail, but I would like you all to discuss the idea of uh, the ability to do all the audits in, in a visit or in a, and that may not be possible, I get it, but, you know, if I have to make an appointment, five different things to get, that's going to be annoying to me. And I was just thinking, how do we... So just put some thought into, how, you know, it's Duke doing the energy audit. It's, it would just be great if there was some kind of program that you could get a lot of it done in one fell swoop for people. You know, people are, they're busy. So I think the easier we make it, and again, I'm just not trying to get into the, the weeds here, <coughs> that I would like everybody to kind of talk about it. And you know, maybe it's a one. Maybe it's a coordination in one day. You know, where a person's only taking one day off of work. Versus, you know, I don't know. I just there's a lot of different audits, or reviews, or whatever. But sometimes people just want to know, what is everything I can do? And they need a person to tell them all that. And however it can be as compacted and easy, I think is important. I think it would be a great service and a great program to offer, not only our residents, but the business community. And maybe it, you know, maybe that's just not possible because of all the different entities that are doing that. Maybe it's a program where we're really going out and speaking to neighborhood associations or <clears throat> corridors or, people don't like to go to those big workshops or those big town halls but they will go to something and if it's on their street or in their neighborhood because it's their friends, it's their neighbors, it's their colleagues, whatever. Um, I just want to try to make it as easy and impactful. So I just throw that out. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. Yep. The next focus area here is quality of life with the goal to promote health and wellness and improve the quality of life for all people. City operations that looks to incorporate sustainability and equity into our capital improvement projects, um, continuing to look at affordable housing and incorporating sustainability within that, looking at more accessibility uh, within our green spaces and our water. Um, and then community collaboration, that is looking to really increase our, our food and our, our urban permaculture. And citizen engagement is all about um, continuing to create those neighborhood resources and find ways to give those uh, to those in need. Any specific questions or comments? Well, you know I do. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah. Um, I had myself marked here. Um, the uh, kayak launch that you guys suggest um, for ADA purposes, I mean, is that just a, that's an aspiration, but there's no location targeted, or is there a location targeted? I don't have an idea yet for a location. Uh, I'm sure our parks department would certainly have some ideas. Uh, but just that the concept of trying to get um, more access to our waterways. Okay, great. Which is a countywide problem, but yeah, I, I hear you. Um, I, I, I love the Voluntary Sustainability Fund in the Utility Bill. I like that idea. I think I actually think you'd probably do pretty well with it, my my sense. Um, and uh, I did have one specific question. No, actually, I think I think that's it. Thank you. Yes, um, I have a question whether we could um, add it in somehow. But if you talk about affordable and sustainable housing, I think you also talk about some of the smaller homes that some of our older 
people generation live in, and yet they don't really have the um, financial equity to work on these homes. So sometimes we just let them slide, where if we had some sort of way to help, you know, these older homes, then we could allow them to be preserved. I mean, you know, for, and that is a for affordable housing. When someone's lived in a house for 50, 60 years or whatever, and they just don't have the financial equity to keep, uh, you know, how do we help? And I, you know, Jennifer, you know, we've had these discussions and I think that's part of the puzzle. And I don't know exactly how we go about that. I don't know exactly how we could help in these needed uh, repairs. Um, so, you know, I would appreciate anybody's thoughts on this matter. If there would be a small funding source or it, maybe this is purely a, a, a the faith community effort? I, I don't know. I, I'm really trying to figure it out in myself, but I think that that's part of the equation that we are not grasping. Hmm. Um, anybody else? It is this where you would, um, you mentioned ADA in here a couple of times, and is it, would, we, would we put our ADA transition plan in here as a mention? I don't think the ADA transition plan will go in this document. I think it's a plan in and of itself. I don't think we're going to attach it to anything. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And I think actually that... that yeah. Well, I mean, I know it's a plan itself, but mm -hmm. I, I just... Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. Now we're moving into the third category, infrastructure and smart development, starting with buildings. The goal here is to promote and expand infrastructure for efficient and green buildings. City operations to incorporate more sustainability efforts through our current buildings um, or new buildings and looking to increase uh, nature connected designs and some different techniques or technologies. Community collaboration is about the educational standpoint and standpoint educating our developers and trying to increase our sustainability matrix doing an update there. Citizen engagement is looking to encourage and educate residents and those who are in the workplace on how to best um, promote sustainability in their buildings or upgrades or better efficiencies. Yeah. Okay, uh, questions, feedback on this? <clears throat> uh, I'm just happy to see, and we made the comment earlier, but. I'm happy to see vertical and mixed-use development in there. Um, I was just wondering, <clears throat> you know, we, we have a real plan for, um, say, solar. I mean, we know that we'll really be looking strongly at taking the solar to particularly our city buildings, by a certain time. What I'm wondering is, is how you do the retrofit, because you will have to retrofit. And so maybe that's part of the equation, too, because you've got, you're building new, but you're also going to have to retrofit for solar. And then I was wondering if we're going to have to build not only to a green standard with solar, but I think we've seen in our own world, we're gonna to have to build a better, a, a product that can really handle pandemics, whatever. I mean, whether it's through the HVAC system, whether it's through the um, 
you know, the certain ways to handle these microorganisms. But I think that that's going to have to be part of our future. And I think it would be short-sighted not to recognize that. Yeah, some of that, the technologies behind that and different techniques. I will say a lot of the solar verbiage and action items, um, energy efficiency, that's in a, a following section after this because um, that's so such a big component that it wasn't just a bullet point under the buildings. It's, it's really its own focus area. But I appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, yeah, um, I was just looking at page 59 where it talks about window upgrades, and I guess I know we did a lot of things for our city hall. Um, did, did we, do we do a lot of these upgrades for the windows themselves? Because we have so much window there. We did, and um, we did some upgrades as well inside the building to address pandemic types of issues. So we did include city halls, $420,000 of solar panels approximately on, on the roof. So but the windows the themselves are upgraded windows? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's cool. I was just, I the, saw that. You mean the UV rated okay. glazing? Yes. And I, I'm just going to take the moment to say I was on staff when we had the first cert, uh, LEED certified building in the county, which is a community center. So awesome. very proud of that. And, uh, and, and again, we just need more of that. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I would just say that... Um, you know what we've learned now since we started adding these green things into our codes, right? Or And having the score sheet, as you mentioned on here and all of that, that most of the products you buy out there are green now. So I absolutely think we have to update. What we did 10 years ago, we've moved past all of that, or 15 mm -hmm. years ago, whatever. So, bless you. I think we have to upgrade our scoring matrix, and I think we have to upgrade what it is we're requiring. You know, for a long time, because a lot of this was new, <clears throat> we, we didn't want to be heavy-handed, we uh -huh. didn't want to be mandating, but there are certain things that we can require that are, I think we need to relook at that, because they're not new anymore. It is just where we're going. So I, I do think we need a cursory review of, of the whole green, what we're, what we're requiring out of people. And that is one of the action items under the community collaboration. Um, we, we did a kind of a review and an increase in those points a few years ago. And like you said, you know, so many things have changed. Mm -hmm. You can't really find inefficient things now. They just keep getting more efficient, which is a good thing. Um, so certainly increasing that points is an action item within here. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you. All righty. The next section is transportation. And the goal here is to promote and expand infrastructure for an efficient, clean, and connected transportation system. This is heavily relying on our multimodal transportation master plan. Um, really coordinating with a lot of the complete streets projects, looking to make a goal of reaching 100% electric vehicle fleet by 2045, and um, trying to work with the community for community collaboration section on alternates, you know, alternative ways of moving around the city, looking at micro micro mobility as a really great option for Dunedin, our golf carts. And then for the citizen engagement, um, looking to help reduce, you know, those single occupancy ve vehicles, that usage and the demand, as well as encouraging them to find those alternates biking and riding the bus and, and other things like that. Comments or questions on transportation? Uh, y yes, ma'am. I know that the um, Sierra Club, the, the dates are we would be uh, self-sustaining by 2035 and the community by 2050. Uh, yet you have the EV fleet transition by 2045. How does that, why do we have 2045 when <clears throat> our goal is 2035? So for our, 
our buildings to be reaching that goal of 100% renewable energy by 2035, um, but also pushing forward in our electric vehicles that they are, that we're making that transition. Um, there's so much new technology in understanding the, the process, the cycle of where we need to get to for different vehicle replacements and the programming that's behind that. So our Ready for 100 is our, our buildings and our infrastructure in that way. Um, and this would be additional in the form of our electric vehicles or the, our fleet. And was that departure from the 2035 part of the original agreement with, with the Ready for 100 campaign? Because I, I haven't seen 2045 anywhere except in this document. So I'm, it was that a, a delineation that we made for, is that part of the Sierra Club? No, I think Ready for 100 <clears throat> is focused on the energy of the buildings. So our fleet is connected, but that's still a separate goal. What is it about? Reducing greenhouse gases and all those things too? So greenhouse gases are, your, your energy sources are certainly a component of greenhouse gases, but so, are, so is everything else. Your, your waste, your transportation. So Ready for 100 is more focused on, on your energy sources. Greenhouse gases is that much broader expanse and what all of these action items are working to reduce. Does the Sierra Club have that same interpretation over their own yeah, I, I aspirations? Yeah, understand, I understand why you're asking. Yeah, I mean, we can have that discussion um, and just see if that's what their intention was behind the Ready for 100 and, and making sure that our goals align and, in that interpretation. And all the other cities, and I'll even keep it to Pinellas County, that have signed on to the Ready for 100 campaign, do they have that same interpretation? Of, of separating energy from transportation. Uh, and is St. Pete have that same? Does Largo have that same? Safety Harbor have that same? I'm happy to go back and, and coordinate with them and, and see to make sure that all of that aligns and if there's any differences. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else? Transportation? On. If I can go back, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Now that I'm going down, down the list, I kind of got focused. On the EV charging stations, mm -hmm. and it gets pretty specific on percentages, 20%, 5%, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> and uh, I guess just, and I guess I'm fine with that, only just to acknowledge that most of your EV charging stations are not for city residents. Because right? if you're in Dunedin and you have an electric vehicle, you're charging at home. So if you drive down to do a pub crawl, you know, you're probably not going to need a charging station downtown. So most of that is actually for, for outside visitors it's coming in from St. Pete or wherever so that they can charge up once they get here. Uh, but the EV install, you, it, it, you acknowledge that it's level two EV charging stations. And I'm just I don't know if this is just a plan, Natalie, but do we want to get focused on on the level two? Can can we say a minimum of a level two just because I know there's going to be changes in technologies and different advancements made in charging stations? And and so I just I read that and I thought, ooh, are we locking ourselves into something that might be out of date in, in the short term? Creating was, more was, flexibility. Was my thought, just to have a little more flexibility. Sorry, that's almost wordsmithing, so I apologize for that, but uh, that's all. Anybody else? I'm going <clears> to <throat> uh, call out a couple of things um, because I, d I didn't see it. I mean, it's mentioned, 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 but it's not really specific, and that's golf cart infrastructure, you know, because it's use of... We need golf cart charging stations, which aren't necessarily the same as electric cars or electric buses. Um, we need, I'd love to see an electric bus charging station somewhere in Dunedin. 
wouldn't be in the downtown. It'd probably be on 580 or something. Uh, but golf cart infrastructure, I mean, we talk about it everywhere. We talked about it in the multimodal. But <clears throat> with, in this charging discussion and charging stations and being EV ready, I want to make sure that we are EV ready for electric vehicles. But as we know, there are grants out there and all those, and, and that's kind of down the road. We have golf carts today, and I get asked every day, where is a golf cart charging station? I have people that move here that pick where they're going to live. I say I, I mean we, because they can have, they have accessible golf cart paths into the downtown. So I feel like it's exceptionally important, and that is replacing a car. You know, they still use their car, but they're using their golf cart instead of the car. So that goes to the greenhouse gases, it goes to all that. Um, so, you know, while we're applying for the grants for the regular EV, I think we can be focused on golf carts today. And, you know, is there specific parking for them? I mean, that's been an ongoing question. I'm not saying there should be. I'm just saying the charging is the problem. And it, we desperately need that. Um, the other piece that I didn't see um, mentioned, but, you know, it's it's public transportation. You mentioned the waterborne. You mentioned the ferry. Uh, and again, it's in the multimodal. But it's increasing the service of the working with our partners to increase the service of the of the public transportation we already got, namely the the, the jolly trolley. We've said that's an ongoing goal, and again, that you increase the service, you remove cars from the road, and all of that. And but we could just, you could say including the trolley, but we have service on State Road 580 that there's a plan for 15 minute service, but nobody is voting to put a referendum before the residents yet. So I mean. We just need to get the funding to do that first. And I don't say we, I mean, but we need to be advocating for public transportation. So I just feel like that, that needs to be mentioned here because it, it is a master plan. And if our ultimate goal is to have better service, we have to also be advocating for better funding to get that. So I think that has to be mentioned. And if it helps me here on, on this section, I was struggling between this plan and the multimodal plan. Right. I have, I have all kinds of thoughts okay, and it's like, well, and it can be, I agree with that. You know, it right. can be, we can mention, refer to multimodal. You know, I'm not saying it has to be a whole, but I do think in the transportation area, those are some things we need to, especially the golf cart charging. If we're going to mention EV, we got to mention the golf cart. And you know, we brief, briefly state uh, charging for golf carts, and you know, if that wants to be elevated a little bit more, uh, we can certainly look at that. And and there's a lot of tie to the multimodal transportation master yeah. plan, and some pages even linked as well, um, because that's such such a big document. Right. That's so comprehensive. Mm -hmm. And I have one more question. Sure. I'm sorry, Mayor. On 63, uh, and it's kind of back to uh, the charging stations, uh, you mentioned update the city codes to require a minimum of 10% parking or development projects that trigger development review to be EV ready. And I, I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, trigger development review, would that include apartments? Um. You know, because when it comes to townhomes yeah. and, and, and things, they kind of, the owner can control their own. But for anybody who lives in an apartment that wants to buy an electric vehicle, they're totally dependent on the owner of the complex to, for their EV charging well, station. Apartments over five units would trigger design reviews, so it would be applicable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, can you explain the, the differentiation between the the car uh, and then the golf cart how how it's differentiated how is it different those stations yeah so you have a much different power need for powering a, a car versus a, a golf cart um, and so there's different connectors that you use for an electric vehicle um, 
which usually you'll have the cord and the plug that can go into the car. Mm -hmm. From the research that I've done and communities that really heavily use golf carts, I've called, you know, and then done research on the villages, for example, and other areas um, that have a lot of golf carts. The, I think the concern right now is that there's so many different types of golf carts. There's so many different types of um, that connection plug that when you provide an outlet for them to bring their own cord, that seems to be the best way currently until there's more of a standard within the golf cart industry. Um, and how many do we have? I know at the library, there's one over in the uh, parking garage, correct? Mm -hmm. There's just, That's it. for the golf carts or for the golf for carts, the golf there's cart. just one at the library. Okay. Oh, I, no, I think there is There's one. also the, yes, the there is forget one about there. that one. There, there, you. you will know, Poe. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's also one in the parking garage. Yeah. So, right. and as like Natalie said, there's, um, golf carts are different in a way too, that there are so many new players and everybody seems to be coming up with their own special little adapter. So it's not you know universal like you're going to go plug the, the plug in into the wall. It's the it's the end that plugs into the golf cart. Uh, I think what we'll be seeing in the future though too is the the different battery powers, uh, specifically uh, lithium ion. As as that changes, that becomes more affordable. You're going to get much more uh, ability and more technical mileage out of your golf cart. Um, with that, you won't need to charge as often. Uh, at the same time, there's a, a, a weight ratio that changes because the lithium ion batteries are so much lighter weight, once again, more mileage. And as I see these new golf carts coming out, most of them are coming built in with their chargers. So really just the, the ability to provi provide a 110 um, volt uh, plug for them to plug into would, would, be the, uh, would be the way to go. I think about um, there's 36 volt, 48 volt, 72 volt, and all the different plugs. To me, it's having somebody sit there and try to figure out what they need to do, which place they need to, to rotate the dial to, and what they're gonna plug it into, I think we'd be buying a lot of golf carts, so. Yeah. What, so what, do you, what are you saying? So just a regular electrical outlet is what we need, instead of one that has the charger built into it. Our car chargers, the, the ones that we have out near for the, the regular vehicles, that has all the electronics and everything built in and, and a standardized plug. For a golf cart, golf carts need some, some form of uh, electrical transformer to transform the, the AC power into the, the battery power. The easiest way for us to provide any kind of charging with that would be just a regular outlet and having those transformers on board with each one of those golf carts instead of having a, uh, a, a outlet. Okay, I get that, it. I, yeah, we can figure that out later. Right. But I, I get what you're saying, but we just need them. We need something. Okay, thank we'll, you, Paul. We'll put Paul on it when we do get it, so. Yeah. <laughs> he really understands it all. Resident expert, right? All right. We, we have the same problem with e-bikes as well. And they all have different chargers to them. Mm -hmm. So the same issue for anybody. Because right. it would be cool if somebody in St. Pete could ride their e-bike down to Dunedin, charge up while they're visiting our shops, and go home. Right. And I think probably with e-bikes, too, we'll start seeing those built in. So once again, all it is is just a standard electrical plug that you'll be using. And so you could be charging an e-bike and a golf cart at the same time. Okay. And someday maybe even a car, the same. Someday maybe even a car. What, what, what are the charge systems for the charging system currently? Have they been up to, upgraded, or where are we with that? The charge systems you mean the electrical charge or the well, I'm gonna come down I'm gonna come down and charge my car so I'm gonna pay a certain fee for doing that currently there's no cost Cor correct currently right now these are all but at some point in time when we're talking about this and getting this going through the community um, what what is what are the systems they have for that now have you seen any of those? Oh, yeah. No, there's more. I mean, even with the systems that we have now, you're, you have to log in, register, that kind of thing, and there just isn't a charge. In the future, you'd be swiping your card or doing something um, via an app on your phone to be able to, to energize that product and be able to charge your car. So the same thing with the regular, for the e-bike, uh, all of them, if, if, particularly if you're using a regular system, you can still going to be able to do that 
comfortably and easily. Right, and we can look at that when we get down to e-bike. Once again, it's, it's going to, there, there isn't a whole lot of infrastructure there other than maybe just a plug, saying, like I said, with the, the golf cart, and we can decide whether we want to charge for that. Uh, I mentioned the lithium-ion batteries as well, just because of the time it takes to charge a golf cart. Um, you know, a lot of times that's, that's 9 to 11 hours, so we're not going to, you know, for, for most people coming to visit downtown, they're not going to spend that much time here you know, and being able to charge in one spot. Either they're going to continue moving or in, in most cases their, their golf carts have enough power to get them, you know, back and forth without any issues. So, but having a, uh, something there w would help, but uh, I, I see it much more simplistic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, I just want to, how many more sections do we have to cover? Uh, we have four. Okay. I just want to call our attention to, you know, we're already running over meeting time by 10 minutes and check in with everybody about their schedules. Do we need a motion to continue or whatever? No, I'm, I'm just making... No, I'm fine. Everybody That's not okay? in your procedures, but I do have another... I have conflicting meetings beginning at 1 p.m. Okay. I don't think we need you for the end if you want to go. I mean, I'm, just let, I mean I'm, fine with, I'm fine with that because this is obviously a policy discussion that you mm -hmm. all are having, but I just wanted to, I didn't want, I wanted to let you know that I do have an act, I have to be in another meeting that begins at 1 p.m. Do we need you for the signing of the uh, bond document? I've already coordinated with my office and you're actually pre-closing pre those documents and I'll sign at my office tomorrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll sign the plat on my way out. Yep. So I need 30 seconds before one to be able to do that. <laughs> Jennifer, you're good? I'm good. Thank you, okay. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, I just now. wanted to be sure. Thank you. The next section is the focus area is water. Uh, the goal here to implement water smart, smart techniques through efficient infrastructure improvements and recognize the importance of mitigating the effects of sea level rise. Um, again, this one really heavily also focuses on our stormwater master plan and some of the recommendations incorporated into that, as well as some programs that are ongoing. And for the community collaboration section, that's really looking to do a lot more around education and campaigns for our, our water infrastructure, whether that's going down your sink drain, reducing the fats, oils, and greases there, to what's going down the storm drain. And the citizen engagement piece is working to um, encourage and educate residents on reducing their water consumption and looking to make, um, you know, best practices that help our overall infrastructure. Okay, any uh, comments or questions on this? I know we talked a lot about it under the other water piece. Yeah. Just one. Uh-huh. One for me. Um, the stormwater enforcement ordinance, it says implement the stormwater enforcement ordinance and that's the one that we approved quite a while ago, and that's so that's not technically been implemented yet. Or is um, it something different? I just want to make sure I understood. It's not something different. It's it's the same thing. It's just encouraging that movement of um, that program. Mm -hmm. If there's a violation, it's codified. Mm -hmm. But we are enforcing it. I mean, if yeah. we see somebody like blowing leaves down the drain or whatever, we are enforcing it. Yes. We're mm -hmm. we're okay. That just, you know, shot up to me. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. Now, you know, I think I thought all your pictures through here were wonderful, but this picture, <laughs> I don't know. It really, mm -hmm. it disturbed me. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. All right. Yep. Um, and then solid waste and recycling is the last one as part of the third category. And the goal here is to reduce solid waste, divert materials from the landfill, and to support regional efforts for zero waste goals. City operations, that looks to um, become a part of the EPA WasteWise program, which gives you a much more outlined um, idea of how you can be reducing your solid waste, as well as trying to reduce single-use plastics and microplastics within city operations and at city facilities. For community collaboration, that's looking to educate the community and work on projects that show there's different ways to handle our waste, either through biodigesters, composting, 
and understanding how to recycle in a correct manner. For citizen engagement, there's lots of uh, action items there that citizens can engage with. That's mainly because uh, Pinellas County produces three times the amount of garbage that the national average American produces. So, but I think that's a, a huge statement to how we can get active right away, how residents can take action in that area um, and have that impact directly from their home or workplace. So looking to do, you know, reducing food waste and trying to um, reduce consumption in areas or consumption of plastic as well. Any specific questions for this? Natalie, would this be a place where we can collaborate and work with our business partners, uh, meaning the local businesses in town, uh, to be ocean-friendly certified? So we uh, kind of maybe didn't address this as much, but that was in the community section, our community, yeah, right. um, okay. really encouraging businesses to become certified. And I know Blue Green Connections is working on a certification process that um, is really localized and unique to Dunedin, but also incorporates some of those other certifications, Ocean Allies, and maybe some other programs that kind of hit on those specific points. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Mm. So, um, you know, we've been talking quite a while about pushing the county, and we've done things. We've, we've done these things about getting a MRF. Uh -huh. Uh, you know, in their in their solid waste master plan. I know <clears throat> just recently I've spoken with several county commissioners as well as Barry Burton since this money is coming in, right? Infrastructure and other things. That's one of the things we've, we're pushing them to use this money for. Um, one of the benefits, as we know, and no big long education speech here is that you know you're not driving down to Sarasota or wherever to dump dump your stuff, and it's not just us; it's all the haulers that are out there. It's having a place right here where it, you're using less gas, less wear and tear on all the regional roads, all of that stuff. Um, so I do think you know mentioning continuing to advocate for a local Pinellas County Central Murph for recycling, helps reduce costs all the way around, as we know about recyclables. Um, Is it North County? It would, I mean, it would be central. It would probably be over there by airport, Airco or the airport or something, you know, somewhere central. Mayor Matt, Everybody. Yes, we, we've made some good progress. Oh, we have. The county administrator called the city managers together uh, a couple weeks ago to discuss the MRF. So I'd like to give you a report on that as a side. But yeah. that's, that's I just want to make sure that we're not losing sight of it, get a mention of it, because they'll say they'll do it in 10 years from now. It still might not be built. I don't know. You know what I mean? I just want to make sure. But he, I think he gets it. He oh, gets, he does. He yeah, gets yeah. our need, our desire. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, is and, and again, uh, I don't know if there should be a mention. I know it's on everybody's mind, and that is, uh, you know, how do we how how do we work with others to solve the cost of recycling itself? I mean, some cities are giving it up altogether because of the high cost to get rid of the recyclables. So. I just think we have to address, we have to have a statement in there somewhere that this is where the world is today. We might not know what the answers are to it, but it is our master plan. So even if there's not a particular thing that we can do right here in Dunedin, that we, it's the advocacy of it. So I do think we have to make mention of that because that's where we are. And I don't see it going away and now with our supply chain issues, I definitely don't see it going away. So I do think we need to just at least acknowledge it. Temporary supply. Mm -hmm. You know, the, I mean, that's temporary, the supply chain yeah. issues. But right. Hopefully. Very temporary, hopefully. But I thought it was the cost um, of the... It is. It's, it's because China's not taking our stuff anymore because it's too contaminated. That's a brief, you know. So... Um, 
it's affected the cost of disposing disposal and and the cleanliness so there's all kinds of things you have to advocate for one of which is how do we get the stuff more clean or how do we get how they recycle it not to worry about that I don't know if that's technology or what but we just need to advocate yeah but I think some of that's in here right Natalie I mean some goals of how to you know, better clean your recycling. Right, and, and it's there. education and stuff. Right. But Absolutely. I mean, I, I think we have to have an advocacy component because it's it's a it's a worldwide issue mm -hmm. that we need to you know we can't solve it, but we can certainly advocate. Well, I know Highlander Man's been busy on this issue. So. <laughs> right, no, he has. He's been he's as busy on a lot of issues, right? right? <laughs> Crush the box. And I love it. Crush the box. New work helps. And I think another component of this is um, creating a lot more awareness and education around understanding that recycling isn't the first go-to. You know, there's there's so many other R's, and that's why I talk about the eight R's of sustainability, rethinking, mm -hmm. repurposing, repair, um, reducing. These are all things that we need to be working on before recycling, and when we are recycling, really educating the community on how to do that correctly. Right. Um, the biggest cost, I mean, one of the biggest costs to recycling is the contamination. And yeah. so continuing to draw That's all good. that down will help with our costs. And I will tell you that there are still those out there that, not a lot, I mean, it's not a lot, but there are still those out there that, you know, have a certain feeling about the fact of how we redid our whole solid waste program. Um, they see it as a reduction in service, and in my mind, it's just a change in service. You know, we replaced one of the barrels with curbside recycling, but reduced how many times they're going through our neighborhood. But it is a complete energy efficient process, that 111. Um, so it wasn't just about a cost thing. It was a bit because at this point, it's costing us the same to do, you know, whether it would, it would be actually more money now if we went back to two. But it's the energy, it's the use, it's the road, the, just the whole thing. It's just such, such a more efficient process. So having that education out there, because there's still those every once in a while that I hear from, um, you know, it's all about dollars and cents. But if you're doing your trash right, if you're separating it correctly and if you're doing it correctly, you should be good. It's the summer months that they, you know, so if to, really in your discussions, if you can talk about if somebody needs an extra barrel, you know, whether it's recycling barrel or a black barrel, whatever, you know, how that can get initiated and maybe be very low cost, and I know you ha you already have stuff, but I'm just saying. Yeah, and we're you know education. working with uh, Sue and Antonella and um, the communications team on creating more videos and education around, you know, your everyday service and and how you engage in that correctly and um, making sure that you get service, you don't get missed, and what you can do to. But that's certainly a part of it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. So the final category of DREAM is consumption and conservation. Here we talk about climate and clean energy with the goal of reducing greenhouse gases and transitioning to that 100% clean renewable energy sources. City operations that's looking to move forward in our Ready for 100 pathway, which I'll bring up in a minute, and conducting more greenhouse gas assessments for our city operations, but also our community and looking to do um, clean energy installations and retrofits, which was kind of discussed earlier today. For community collaboration, that's looking to start really engaging on the Ready for 100 pathway for our community goal, looking at um, the possibility of solar co-ops and more education around that, and continuing to uh, have our solar energy rebate that we offer for residents and businesses. And then for the citizen engagement, it's looking to educate on reducing energy consumption and, um, and trying to increase efficiencies within the home or the workplace. I will say this section does cover our Ready for 100 pathway, which is a timeline kind of going through how we got there, um, what we need to be doing now, and some of the targets for our future 
we do have that uh, minimum 40% of our city operations goal for our buildings to be on clean energy by 2024. So that's through the Clean Energy Connection Program with Duke Energy. That does not include the, the solar that we have been installing on our buildings. So we'll be higher than 40% um, in two years, which is great. And we're gonna continue to work on those uh, target points. But is there any specific questions about this focus area or the Ready for 100 pathway? Questions, comments? I did. Uh -huh. Thank you for bringing that up about now the principal question that I had was about the timing on that. I know we said we were going to be putting those on the buildings. I know we put it on, I read that we put it on some of the buildings. Um, and you just made a comment that by 2024, perhaps someone else can answer that question, but from the budget standpoint, does it look like we'll be on that, on that schedule achieving that? For the 2024? Yeah, I'm just curious. Yeah, so the Clean Energy Connection Program with Duke Energy, they're building solar fields mm -hmm. kind of in the middle of the state of Florida, and cities or businesses have been subscribing to that. Um, there will be an upfront cost, which I'm getting that information from Duke Energy um, on our energy bills, but over the long term, that's going to save the city money. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, so you feel that our plan for the Ready for 100 that will actually achieve it? Yeah, and I know that you know when you get closer to that 2050 goal, there's kind of a lot to be said. You know, there's a lot to be incorporated into that, um, and it's kind of open because there's a lot that we need to learn. There's a lot of partnerships and programs. We don't know exactly what technology we'll have at that point, so keeping it open, but knowing that we need to start making steps now, steps today, um, not only on our city operations, but for that community-wide goal. And you know, the first step is really working to reduce energy consumption citywide, whether that's businesses, homes, or our own government buildings. Mm -hmm. So Natalie, um, I'm thinking that 2015 might, might, 2050 might be about the year you'd retire. So are you committed to being here with us and seeing this through? <laughs> I hope. That's a yes, Natalie. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. She might be sitting right here, by the way. Yeah, there you go. That's right. Even better. Um, yeah, I'd like to make sure that, again, this that takes me back to the same thing I said earlier. I'd like the Sierra Club to review this and... And they did review this. This piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. So okay. I really appreciate all their comments and engagement, um, as well as their resources for this. Okay. All righty. We've made it to the last focus area. I should have like little noisemakers or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so we have consumption, consumer consumption. And the goal here is to reduce the consumption of natural resources, encourage conservation efforts, and promote a circular economy. City operations looking to work on creating a sustainable procurement and purchasing policy and understanding that um, you know, when we spend dollars, city dollars, <clears throat> we're certainly voting for the type of industries and, and world that we want to see. So looking to do that. And community collaboration is encouraging community sharing and reduction challenges, some fun engaging things for residents or the workplace to do. Citizen engagement is looking to do um, that same type of thing where you're engaging the community in education and advocacy around <laughs> reducing consumption and really enjoying where they live, enjoying their connections and some partnerships uh, as well as their neighborhoods. Um, any specific questions for this section? Comments, questions? One comment. <laughs> okay. All righty. Well, thank you. I've really appreciated all of your attention and time on this and your feedback. Um, we're going to kind of quickly go over the next steps. I know we're kind of in a time crunch. So 
Again, we are going back to that <coughs> five actions per year idea. When you have five in the three categories, you're looking at something called Dream 15. And so that will be 15 items to take on um, every year to either implement or continue working on. And uh, it was, you know, we really need to carefully pick the ones that we're going to start with to make that impact and really elevate the community's voice, which was <coughs> what we did with our listening sessions and the surveys and everything. So we are using that methodology report and the engagement with the community to see what they want to see happening as a priority and making sure that's in alignment with the local, regional, and global efforts for those solutions for climate change. The recommendation for next steps uh, for city operations to start with is sustainable landscaping on city property, S uh, city staff sustainability training and engagement, sustainability and equity and capital improvement projects, ready for 100 pathway, and the greenhouse gas assessments. Any comments on those for city operations? Okay. Oh. Okay. Okay. I have a question. Oh, yeah. sorry. I'm not, I'll wait till you're done. Okay. For community collaboration, recommendations to start with would be working on the wildlife corridors, creating a local environmental task force for the schools and building, uh, for the schools and businesses, sustainable building education, looking to promote the eight R's of sustainability, reduce, reuse, recycle, repair, that kind of thing. And then food waste prevention, which the state of Florida does have food waste prevention week, which we like to line up with. And finally, the citizen engagement part is encouraging residents to certify their yard. Sharing is caring, working on creating that, um, the neighborhood collaboration, telecommuting and teleworking as that's kind of still our current state of things taking the pledge to reduce our plastic reduction and taking a quiz on how many earths does it take to sustain your lifestyle to really encourage that educational um, piece as well as the awareness. Okay, comments on it? Well, I will make one comment. I, I think it, Jennifer knows this, but telecommuting, teleworking, I think it's great. We've learned a lot. We can use it in a great way, but it's a balance as we know, because we've also seen the other side of it where sometimes customer needs aren't getting met, so it's, it's that balance that you'll have to strike. Um, one question, it doesn't have to do exactly with this, um, but I know that you didn't give a number of how many people actually came to forums for input. I know that it was relatively small because of COVID and some of the complexities, and then we had about 198 involved in this survey. <clears throat> so, um, and so I guess the question maybe to you, Jennifer, um, you know, as we move down the path, it seems like we need to, you know, strengthen up our, you know, the input that we've gotten because it's a little weak because of the situation by which we did our surveys. Um, you know, I know we're going to be talking even next time about our citizen survey. I just wonder if we can't, you know, make sure that we're kind of um, reemphasizing what are the priorities of our community and some of our surveys that we do, both because I think businesses didn't give input at all in the survey. There was no business that provided input. So potentially in our citizen survey or in our, in our um, survey to businesses, maybe we can just kind of strengthen um, what, what we think we've learned from what we do have and, and, and just make sure we're on the right tracks of the priorities that the citizens have and the businesses have. Because businesses, I mean, if, you look in a lot, if you listen a lot, even at the national level, you know, there's so much more businesses can do at their level than even one citizen can do. Although it takes us all, they can have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. um, so um, just, and I, if you want to comment to that, is that well, doable or? Well, I, I mean, I don't want to. Yeah, the yeah. forums, and I know that Natalie actually had a table at, at some of the uh, festivals and those types of things, Did, didn't you? You know, the, the difficult part was that this, when we had planned for all these community sessions and, and bringing the community together, we were in the thick of mm -hmm. staying apart, mm -hmm. um, which is which was really difficult. I think to we tried to gain as much of the community's voice as possible during that time. Um, I certainly, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing up the businesses who had so much going on. They were mm -hmm. figuring out staffing right. and and how they, you know, just proceed in their day to day. Um, that we weren't really able to reach them at that point. But I certainly agree that incorporating them into the conversation, again, is, is really important. 
And actually, I thought the way, you know, you communicated it in the document, you're very transparent about what you were able to find out what you weren't. And of course, you were, like you said, it was a pretty unique time. So that was, that was the bulk of my question there. And I think the role of CEQ most certainly and all the other organizations that were enveloped into the process was really robust. And, and those are really the subject matter experts. And so I think that, that you know, the document is predicated upon that type of input and, in fact, <coughs> contribution as well. So engaging the general public at large, I think we can certainly do another round and see how we did. Um, but I'm really, I'm really proud of the work that was done as far as soliciting input of the experts. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. No, but I, I just want to get to the art. What, I, what I'm saying is in, in our ongoing citizen surveys and businesses, can we kind of incorporate to validate some of the things that we've learned, especially because some groups just really, because of the pandemic, maybe didn't. Yeah, absolutely. Your next work from. session, actually, you're going to see the citizen right. survey. It's coming up. So we'll have a look at the questions there, and I'll talk to Nicole about incorporating something in there. Sure. Okay, that was really my point. Yeah. And you I, know, would just like jump, I would like to jump in and support that in total. I, I went through and looked at those numbers, but I was fine with that. And, I, and I, the report, there's no, nothing negative about the report at, at all, n n nor is she, mm -hmm. I, right. I don't believe. And But I think the point is to the, to the city manager and to everyone is that is that we, we hear a lot of that. When I, I just did it. A thing on the on the subject we discussed today, and I talked to a lot of people, um, a lot of people. But it's hard to get them, and it's hard to get them. I, I, even before the COVID, I've watched this. I've watched us try to get information, and sometimes I'm not sure we're not, in some cases, leading some of the information because we're just trying to get it. But so I think it's a great comment for all the surveys that we do, uh, is that we really try to get information and then later to perhaps validate it you know uh, from people i realize it is very very difficult so i'm not jumping on any past things i'm just saying it'd be good going forward just that we keep that in mind so exactly what she had said right now was going to be a comment that i was going to make about this survey but i like it about all the surveys thank i appreciate you. that thank you okay what's next that is it now can we thank them yes <laughs> Thank you to everyone. I do, I do want to give a chance for wh whoever yeah. is the representative for today on the CEQS to come up and say a few words if they'd like to. Hope spots, yeah. <coughs> final comment. Who there is on CEQ? I'm the only one. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. City's Committee for Environmental Equality. We're, we're very pleased about the fact that this plan is created and, and coming to uh, coming to completion. Uh, we're very grateful to Natalie for the time she's put into it. We've, we're grateful for the input that we've gotten from the uh, that she's gotten from the community. Uh, so thank you and thank you to the commission for your interest in this subject and in, in sustainability and in climate change and greenhouse gases and we, we do appreciate the fact that uh, it's something that uh, you, you folks are paying attention to. So thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm not going to speak as a member of the CEQ any longer. I just want to address a few points that came up though that I made notes on. Um, just, uh, for instance, uh, the brightness of streetlights. Um, although much is made of the fact that LED lighting is uh, usually brighter than the uh, incandescent lighting it replaces and uses a lot less energy, it doesn't inherently need to be brighter than the uh, bulb it's replaced. So if the lights are simply brighter somewhere, that's really something you should take up with Duke. Uh, if you need shielding and things like that, that's a different subject. But if the lights are just too darn bright, um, there's probably an alternate uh, bulb that can be put in that's just not as bright. So it doesn't necessarily have to be, LED lighting doesn't necessarily have to be brighter. Uh, there was concern about uh, solar retrofitting. Um, I don't have a figure, but I could comfortably say that 90% of all rooftop solar in this industry is done on a retrofit basis. Um, the solar, the rooftop solar industry is built on retrofitting. It's not built on installing it in new construction. <clears throat> Probably closer to 98% of all rooftop solar is installed in a retrofit situation. So really the only holdback <clears throat> for retrofitting is, is there's enough sun on that hits the roof. Uh, but there's, there's good solutions for- And that's uh, my problem. I don't, I don't have enough sun. I have too many trees. 
you're familiar with your neighborhood and it's got a lot of trees and it's got a lot but of shade. It's very a nice. Benefit for yeah. energy use. Yeah, but it's just not a it's just not a good place for solar power. Right. And uh, but if you got sunlight, you got potential for solar power. Um, a, a scoring matrix um, for building. Um, it's something that's come up and I've personally brought up a couple times in uh, CEQ meetings that it's just gotten too easy really to meet these requirements that we have. Uh, we need to challenge uh, our builders, our contractors more, especially in the light of the fact we made the Ready for 100 commitment and we want to move this, this, uh, committee to, uh, this community to clean energy, um, tightening up, making, uh, making the, the standards higher for, uh, for uh, our, uh, what do we yeah. call the matrix? What's what's the name the of the sustainability the matrix? Okay. Yeah, making the making that a higher bar to reach, I think is it's appropriate. It's, it's past due. Uh, let's see. And uh, okay, those are the only technical points I just wanted to bring up that came up in the subject that I could speak about a little bit. But we at the CEQ are, are very glad that uh, we've got a plan now. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, using it as a uh, springboard, I suppose, for, for more ideas that we can uh, bring forward to the commission and to the, the city manager. Well, we're very impressed with the amount of work that you all did. I mean, you know, I, I, I know you got outside, some outside assistance here and there, but think about this. This is a master plan that was That's created wonderful. not by a consultant yeah. and not just by an employee. I mean, this is probably the, the most collaborative master plan we have ever done in the history of the city of Dunedin. So. Thank you, Alan. Any of the other organizations that are here, would they like to come up and speak? You know, we've got the Blue Green, any of them, the, the Plant Society, whoever, whoever's here wants to come up. Come on down. All of our Gladys Douglas. <laughs> Okay, so I'm Vicki Love. I'm a resident of Dunedin. I'm also on the board for Blue Green Connections, which is, as you know, a local uh, environmentally focused nonprofit. Um, I'm a former CEQ member and I'm a regular attendee of the CEQ meetings and I'm an active CEO club. I, uh, first, I want to thank all of you guys for everything that you've done for sustainability and the environment. It's a, it's a great place to live and I really appreciate the continued interest and in, in all the efforts that you guys make. I was an active participant in developing this plan, and I want to say that I was very, very impressed by the diversity of perspectives and expertise that Natalie brought in to develop the plan. It resulted in a really good, balanced plan. The, the graphic that she showed at the beginning, that sustainability is a balance between economy, social, and... <clears throat> excuse me, an environment. It's not just words that she's saying. She really did do that, and it really was reflected in this plan. And balance, as you all know, is really important. When we don't have balance, we go one way to one extreme or the other. We don't accomplish nearly as much as when we try and stay balanced. She did a great job of, of balancing all those perspectives. Another example of the balance in the plan is it's a good mix of leveraging other cities, the country's ideas of common sense and out of the box ideas and Dunedin specific ideas. It's also a very good mix of large projects and small projects and together I think that collectively makes this a plan that, that we'll really be able to accomplish something with. So as a coastal community and as a densely populated coastal community, I think it's really important to have a plan that will help, us, help guide us on the, the path for this. This plan will do that. I think it will also inspire our residents to take actions on their own. And as you know, it, it, takes, it takes the village, it takes, it takes government, it takes community, it takes individuals. And I think this plan has, has aspects to all of that and it will be uh, something that we can really achieve great things with. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing it approved, to seeing it implemented. And I think Jeff even um, brought up earlier, it needs to be kept a living document because mm -hmm. technologies change, goals change. So I'm looking forward to being a part of that and seeing how this pans out for the city that I love. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from any of the other organizations? 
Hello. Hi. Uh, my name is Melissa Gallivan. I'm a resident of Dunedin, 1460 Wetherington Way, and I'm a member of the Sierra Club's Dunedin team. I am thankful to live in a city that is a leader on so many fronts, including the environment. I've watched the commission work together to, pres to preserve what is wonderful about Dunedin, while at the same time strive to become more sustainable. All it takes is a quick drive around Dunedin to see what, that we have benefited from thoughtful, forward-thinking leaders, and the dream presentation is just another wonderful manifestation of that. My special thanks goes to Natalie Gass for all of her work. I think it would be great for Dunedin to take a moment to do some bragging, have an analysis done, maybe with the help of a local college or a grad school, so the community can see how much taxpayer money and energy you've already saved or expect to save as a result of some of the actions you've taken over the past 10 years. Um, you have implemented an internal energy policy, installed solar panels, upgraded HVAC system, utilized LED lights, and much, much more. This would garner additional community support for future investments and possibly inspire members of the community to transition themselves to clean energy. For example, Orlando hired a policy impact group that provided estimates for money and energy savings, job creation, water preservation, and reduced healthcare costs associated with part of their clean energy program that they were implementing. Orlando's website makes it clear on more than one web page that one of their priorities as they move towards clean energy is, and I quote, saving businesses and residents significant amounts of money. Many of Dunedin's potential citizen engagement action items listed in the DREAM document could also be analyzed for financial and energy savings. In another example, the Pinellas County Schools website details how they partnered in 2015 with an energy services company and dramatically reduced their energy use and saved well over $20 million. I wholeheartedly support the hiring of an energy analyst, <laughs> energy manager, and or an energy services company so that Dunedin is able to take the steps needed to realize the energy and financial savings as detailed in the dream presentation. Um, from listening to discussion, I also noted that banning single-use plastics in the city will help reduce the cost of recycling. And that could also, you know, sharing information with the community about the cost of recycling could also help them understand why you have to put bans into place. I would also urge the city to create internship and fellowship programs. Orlando calls their internship program the lifeblood of their, of their um, uh, sustainability programs. These would support Dunedin's transition to clean energy, while at the same time providing a fantastic opportunity for high school, college, and graduate students. Once again, thank you for all you have already done and for committing to a healthy and safe future for our community. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Anyone else wish to come forward and say anything? <clears throat> come on down. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dave Silman. I am a member of the executive committee of our local Sunco Sierra Club, and I just wanted to share a couple of, uh, first of all, a, a huge thanks to Natalie for quarterbacking this effort. It's an amazing plan. The, uh, the process, which was so inclusive of community input, was wonderful and inspiring, and we appreciate it. Now, and to your earlier comment, um, Ms. Mayor, um, although we weren't formally a part of drawing up the plan, Natalie has been absolutely wonderful to reach out to the Sierra Club and solicit our support. We so look forward to helping um, uh, make you know the Ready for 100 goals in particular a reality. So um, it's, it's, it's a very exciting future. I spent most of my uh, last year plus leading the campaign to get a Ready for 100 commitment from the county, right. um, which I'm happy to say came to fruition last November. I hope that will lead to a lot of synergies and collaboration, make your goals easier to achieve through working with them. And I just wanted to share a few key takeaways from my experience. Um, uh, number one, in, in the years intervening since you all made your commitment in 2018, um, the, the momentum of other cities and corporations making these goals has been phenomenal. Um, there's uh, 180 plus U.S. cities, 15 counties, nine states and territories, and over 300 global corporations, and I am talking from the top down, that are making these commitments and they are coming out ever faster every year just 
you know, justifying that many, many people are looking at this idea and coming to the same conclusions that you did. And uh, I can speak to the county. They made their decision in no small part because of your leadership. So I thank you for that as well. Um, number two, a part of my experience, uh, I, I came across so much analysis. New analysis is coming out all the time to the feasibility of this idea. It's becoming, it's a brave new world to be sure, but it's becoming ever clearer all the time that this is a quite doable goal. And number three, you know, despite the, um, the dire need to do this as quickly as we can, um, you know, the economic rationale to transition to 100% clean energy becomes more compelling all the time. Business experts across the, the country are, are viewing this now as arguably the greatest business opportunity ever. This energy touches everything. Sustainability is even more broad-based, and um, it's, it's an exciting time, and you're showing great leadership, and, and I thank you and applaud you. Thank you very much, Dave. Appreciate that. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, we'll just do some final wrap-up comments. I'll start with Vice Mayor. Well, um, I've been very impressed, Natalie. I, you obviously really were able to bring people to this excitement of collaboration in such a strong field and a very varied <clears throat> field. I mean, you have all these different components. It's very, um, it's very sophisticated. I mean, I read it twice, and I'm still thinking about things. So... I just want to thank all of you. Thank you, Natalie, for having the leadership qualities to bring everyone together. Thank you, each of the organizations, for lending your own expertise and leadership. And I do believe this document will well serve us for many years to come. A living document, to be sure, because the best documents are living. I mean, they, they change with technology and times and... But again, uh, I was very impressed. I thank all of you. Um, I think it will serve us for many, many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Gow? Thank you, Mayor. Um, now that you're going to hear a lot of the same thing uh, up here, which is, which, which is wonderful. I just can't thank you enough over this document and understand the energy and effort and the passion that you put into this the collaboration that you did in the time of the pandemic and the, the, the hurdles that you had to overcome to get all this done and prepared <clears throat> and politely nudging and encouraging people to get their part done to you. But this was very, very well put together. And the idea is the mayor said that this is probably the most collaborative plan that the city's ever done, just speaks volumes to who we are as a community and who the residents are. You know, I always pride myself in the fact that we are a very uh, community-driven uh, organization. And so this just speaks volumes to that. Uh, so thank you to you. Thank you to the Sierra Club. Thank you to everybody that was involved. The UF, um, IFAS uh, was very much involved with this. Um, the Our Lady Lords, thank you to them. Thank you to the middle school. Thank you to all the residents. Thank you to CEQ. Thank you. The list goes on and on and on and on. And so it's just very impressive to be part of this. And I'm so excited to, uh, to turn the pages and, and go through it and see what we can do for 2035, 45, and 50. So thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Franny? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, fantastic. I mean, Totally. I, Natalie, to you and everybody involved. I mean, it's readable. I mean, the color coding, the links, the icons, the, you know, it's just very readable. And um, and as somebody used the word uh, inspiring, and, and uh, I, I think it, it inspires thinking. It inspires, like, you know, really sometimes how, how uh, consumption-oriented and mindless we have become with some of the things we do and the impacts it has. So, fantastic a piece of work um uh one of the inspirations i thought of as i read it is like from now on one of my goals is to take a tupperware thing with me to restaurants so that they don't put my leftovers in styrofoam and you know so and when you think about it that helps everybody 
and and it seems so easy to do so little things and i think i think that's what this thing inspires you to do so um can't say enough about it i'm excited about it i'm proud about it i think it's we're just again we're continuing to lead and the fact that so much collaboration was in it it's 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 inspiring and it will inspire other cities and counties to to get on board so thank you and hopefully our citizens number one one person at a time commissioner Twenga. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Mo. if you took me to the restaurant with you, you wouldn't need to have the tumble. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say thank you to everybody that worked on this and, and Natalie. So to make this short, Commissioner Kynes, and, and can I just steal everybody else's, and Commissioner Kynes specifically, can I have yours as well? Whatever she said was just right on, <laughs> and whatever, it, whatever everyone else said. So thank mm. you very much. Thanks, everybody. Great, great report. Thank you. Uh, you know, when I think back to 2017, when we brought forward the mayor's challenge for 100, I think it was an email I got from the Sierra Club about it um, back then. I think that's, and then I brought it forward to the commission. So think about that as to where we are today. It was a simple email that, um, so I think it goes to show you that one small action that you think, you know, five years later, here we are with like, you, you know, the most collaborative plan that we've ever done and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I'm just so impressed with, with the committee too, you know, their, specific assistance in helping thing with things. Um, you may need a whole department of your own over there. <laughs> Just saying, not, you know. We, we must have a sustainable budget, however. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just. I'm with you. I'm just saying solid waste is not the only place for you. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Um, so thank you. You're going to go big places. Uh, two quick questions on next steps. Um, you've heard, you're clear on direction as some things to add. And of course, we're not giving you specifics. It's just, and, and maybe look at some stronger language instead of, I don't know, aim. You know, you, you're trying to push us. Uh, now, will that come back to us? I mean, like, I don't want to have to go through this whole thing again. That's, that's a waste of our time. But I mean, maybe you just send us a summary of the things that you're adding or, or if, is it coming back in like resolution form or something that we're, so that we're formally accepting this? I think actually it's important that it comes back via resolution. So the city commission. Okay. So maybe you can give us. Not a red line or nothing like that. Just give us a separate one pager that says what changed. What changed? So yeah, very we'll easily what that. changed, and we could go refer to It'll it. It'll actually come through on consent, um, and, and that's we'll give fine. You the document that shows everything that changed or was incorporated as a result. Yeah, because I don't want to talk about it again. We've talked about it, and we're getting ready to have the mobility plan, and I feel like we're going to talk about it again. Mm. But we already did. And part two of that, <laughs> Mayor, was that a message? It is a message. <laughs> To really put yeah, legs no. on this, though. Well, it's smart to bring it back under consent. Right. Well, I think any plan like this, it's important the city commission adopt the plan. Right. So um, the other aspect is these initiatives, uh, you know, Natalie's talking about five per year per, um, per category, will be rolled into the business plan now. And right. you'll see them again um, as part of the business plan. So, right. And we're actually incorporating within the business plan now a column that is which master plan the initiative belongs Good. to as well, and that's that, as a result of something that uh, Commissioner Gao had asked for. So this has legs. It's it's going to be a living document. Yeah, very good. Doesn't a, um, wouldn't it have to come under action as a resolution because I don't... I don't think it does. Mm -hmm. If it comes under consent, I'll ask to have it pulled. Yeah, okay, it's going to be an action item. I would item. like to see it as an action item with a resolution because, again... Well, I just... I, and that's fine. I just... I think it's really important that we don't rehash everything because this, that's what today was for. 
And, and I can't disagree with you, but it, but it needs to be public. It needs to be acknowledged. Okay, you heard. You see all the nodding heads I got here. It. It's going to come back as an action item, and we're going to bring it back relatively quickly too. Yeah. Yeah. The other quick question. You talked about a task force. This isn't going to be something new, like a new committee. I, I'm I'm watching her sweat over there. I mean, I would right. I'm assuming it's going to be our environmental quality committee and sustain whatever you know. It's it's taking that and just encouraging more residents to get involved in. Um, you know, either working with schools or businesses to continue these efforts, not another new committee. All right, well, let's be creative about that so that it isn't, you know, and maybe that should, maybe an environmental quality committee, you know, subcommittees or, I don't, I don't know, I just don't want to. Subcommittees, wait. Oh, no, I, I know, but you know what I'm saying. I just don't want to reinvent the wheel and create a whole brand new committee because we're no, trying, that's... we're trying to get a, Mayor? Grip. Mayor, if I may, though, because that was a question I was going to have, that what the link between those committees would be. And, um, you know, and I, I don't remember how the resolution reads as far as who's on that, but you may not have the people that you need to be on that. And, you know, so I want you to do what's most important to you to be effective to get this done and, you know, that you and Jennifer can work that out. But whatever it is, I want yeah, to support Yeah, if it means it. you have to add another but the resolution Slot on the committee that or whatever that's fine but yeah I don't want a separate committee I want them Thanks. to decide what they need and tell us so, or, or you know recommend it oh no, so. I get it but whatever that saying, is we don't yeah I, get the, it. I think the, we're saying the same thing yeah the task force is okay. not <laughs> supposed to replace or compete with CEQ it's a coordination it's it's expanding that voice okay um, so anyway, thank you. Thank you very much for everything. Thank you guys. Um, you're good. It'll come back. Uh, and we're, uh, um, we are at 1.30. I'd like to skip over all the items at the end of our agenda again because we're at 1.30 and I still have people waiting on us for signatures and things that thought I'd be doing it at 12.30. I have one comment I really want to make. I'm sorry? I really want to make one comment though. Okay. Sorry. Um, and, and it has to do just with this. Um, and that is, um, Jennifer, maybe you can think about this, but it just seems like we're, we're out of balance with our meetings. We're loaded up on Tuesday and then we go home early on Thursday. So, um, and I just, I'm not always sure that when you have that level of expectation, I had to leave the last meeting that ran over an hour and a half late. I missed the end of the discussion, you know, and that was because we were only, we were supposed to end an hour and a half earlier. I had a meeting I'd already pushed. So it's a, to me, it's balance. I, I don't want to, and I, I get it when we have public hearings on Thursday, that's a whole different thing. But there's other times that maybe staff, Jennifer could work with that and make sure we're more balanced because I don't think it, it adds to effective decision making when when we're sawed of whack like that. I Just think it's good, and I don't disagree, but I do think it was because we canceled a meeting in December because some of our public hearings got moved out, and I and we also and we also moved out the Juneteenth. I'm just being mindful because yeah. if, I think it's an end result yeah. of something. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a it's a norm. I yeah, think it's it, actions we took that were so, sort of beyond our control. But historically, we went to adding, you know, two extra meetings, which were work sessions, to take pressure off of Thursday for public hearings. And it seems like now we're loaded up here. And so, and I get it. I just want to, I want to watch that balance. Um, because I think there are a lot of people that do watch more on Thursdays. And they turn it on, they barely get it on, and we're done because we don't have that much. Mm -hmm. But all the meaty stuff is here. So just want to, I just, just my opinion to, maybe watch that balance. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe it's a, a thing to better market how much we actually do in our workshops, how much ground we prepare to be able to put it in an action item. I mean, just to continue to market that a lot goes on in our workshops. I love our work session, workshops and sometimes even like this, if one of us had to leave, we would have been cut short of what, to me, was the best discussion of the whole meeting. Mm -hmm. So I just, again, I'm just trying to think about how we can best do that. I agree with Mo. 
Okay. Thank you, Jeff. All right, thank you, everybody. We are adjourned. Thank you for watching this City of Dunedin government meeting. If you'd like to review any part of this meeting or watch any previous government meeting coverage, you can watch these meetings online anytime through the city's website, DunedinGov.com. Stay connected with everything Dunedin. Follow the city on this channel and on the city's Facebook page, through Twitter, and on the city's YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching this Dunedin Television production.